Um, I am really proud to have uh, such a distinguished group of top uh, China experts in Tallinn. I think it is really important uh, for us in Estonia to be involved in uh, research on the increasing influence by China and indeed today the focus will be on the um, influence activities uh, of the Chinese Communist uh, Party. Of course you might uh, know that uh, the primary security concern for Estonia is always Russia. But uh, nevertheless, um, we do observe uh, the growing impact of China on our security in this region, in Europe. And it has been a rapidly rising topic for the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute. And I am very grateful to Frank Juris, who has put this uh, event together and, and has been actively working on, on different China-related issues over the past years. So why, why China is so important and how it matters, uh, there is um, the growing indirect impact that uh, comes through the changing uh, global strategic environment with the shifting focus of the US more to the Indo-Pacific uh, region, but also uh, the a uh, growing uh, partnership between Russia and China, which is, by the way, one of the topics that uh, our institute is, is currently uh, researching. But then there is also the more direct uh, influence of uh, China and, and um, in particular the Chinese uh, Communist Party. It can be sometimes uh, quite subtle and uh, invisible, sometimes less so. But uh, we really need then the China experts uh, to dig into these uh, sources that uh, might not be visible or, or accessible to, to uh, the broader public in order to understand how the Chinese influence actually works, uh, how it happens. And we need to continue the work to raise awareness in our societies about uh, how it works and why it uh, matters and, and uh, also of course to find ways to improve our resilience in order to not be kind of influenced or in order for our societies and our systems not to be undermined or weakened by this uh, sort of uh, influence activities. Uh, let me also highlight a couple of uh, other recent projects uh, that the Institute has done that are related to uh, today's topic. Uh, we have had in the past couple of years a series of uh, um, high-level uh, speakers, uh, the China speakers series uh, with events. Uh, most recently we had uh, uh, Bonnie Glazer from the German Marshall Fund of the US uh, speaking about uh, uh, Chinese global influence and uh, also we have had uh, China awareness series of uh, publications uh, again with <coughs> with high level uh, foreign experts uh, and also our Estonian experts uh, writing about various uh, aspects of uh, China's growing uh, global and regional impact for example the latest uh, brief was by Nadej Roland on Chinese view on a new global order so I encourage you all to also take a look at our website for these uh, earlier uh, projects. And of course, a uh, big thank you to Synopsis, uh, who is organizing this event in, in partnership with the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute at uh, ICDS. Uh, this is a series of uh, events, and this time in, uh, in Tallinn. And uh, once again, I am really happy and proud that uh, we have this uh, group of experts uh, discussing this important topic here today. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Christy. So maybe, uh, <coughs> well, first of all, thank you. Thank you for uh, having us here in Tallinn. And thanks, everybody, for showing up so early on this uh, very cold morning. You could all be sitting in a sauna. Uh, so I really appreciate that you're sitting here instead. And uh, we'll try to make it worthwhile for you. <laughs> Uh, as uh, Christy mentioned, this is, a s this is uh, already a fourth um, 
in a series of our annual workshops that we organize as synopsis. Uh, all of the previous ones uh, had been in Prague. This is the first one that we uh, hold, uh, not quite overseas, but in a, in a <laughs> abroad uh, in here in Tallinn. So we're very, very grateful to our co-organizers, co the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute and the International Center for Defense and Security for hosting us. They have been fantastic hosts. Maybe let me say a few words about uh, Synopsis. I suppose it's an, uh, it's an organization that may not be uh, quite familiar uh, to everybody here. It's, uh, it's basically a small think tank uh, uh, based in Prague, Czech Republic, that we have uh, started about five years ago in, in 2016 as a response to some of the policy changes in Central and Eastern Europe, and in particular in the Czech Republic. Uh, we, are, we all have uh, Chinese studies background, so we, we're basically a bunch of sinologists from uh, Charles University in Prague. And we felt at that time that the discourse on China was uh, rather uh, uninformed, uh, to, to put it uh, mildly, uh, throughout the region. This was the time of the, uh, uh, of the setting up of the uh, 16 plus 1 and later 17 plus 1 uh, framework in the region. And it was accompanied with uh, uh, rhetoric that we, uh, you know, being trained sinologists, considered uh, not entirely realistic. Uh, again, to put it mildly. So we felt a duty to actually try and bring reliable uh, information, reliable analysis into the public discourse, uh, first in the Czech Republic, which was our own environment, and then um, later on also internationally. So that's why we set up uh, Synopsis in the first place. Uh, we don't really call it uh, a think tank ourselves very often because the, we see the role to be slightly different. Uh, or maybe wider, because apart from uh, pure research, we also focus uh, on uh, outreach, on working with the mainstream media in particular, to channel the results of the research, to channel the, the information and knowledge that is available in the academia and in the think tank world, to channel it uh, to where it's most needed. Uh, which is the public discourse and um, also, of course, the, um, the decision makers um, in our respective countries, the policy makers. Uh, so we have focused very much on this, uh, on this outreach. We've been working very closely with uh, mainstream media, particularly in the Czech Republic. Uh, we have been writing quite a lot, not only uh, 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 in academic platforms, but also for general interest media. Uh, we have also uh, been uh, trying to develop an international network of uh, research collaborators, uh, and you will see some of them presenting their research findings today, because we believe that the, the phenomenon of um, uh, uh, Chinese, or more specifically CCP, influence and interference in foreign countries cannot really be fully understood within the constraints of national states, that you really need to look at it cross in a cross-border perspective, and uh, by now probably globally, because it really is a, a phenomenon of uh, global significance. So uh, we have been working with our research partners in foreign countries on uh, what we call re network research projects, uh, trying to apply some of the research methodologies that uh, we have been developing uh, uh, to uh, other societies and come up with, uh, with case studies and uh, country surveys, um, uh, not only in the Czech Republic, but also internationally. So uh, I think uh, that's probably the, uh, well, well, maybe one more thing. Um, I would encourage you to uh, look at our website, because and, and if you do, uh, please keep in mind that we actually have two websites. So one of them is uh, uh, the Czech language website, which may be inaccessible to most of you. But we also run an English language website, and the, uh, the results of, the, of our research is mostly reflected on this English language website, because the Czech one is mostly uh, geared towards uh, media. 
Uh, so I think that's, uh, that's about all I wanted to say about uh, synopsis. We can talk about it um, some more during the discussions. And um, I think that we can probably go straight to the first uh, panel. Um, Oh, um, thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, I think we really owe a big thank to our guests because they came from very far places, and especially, um, I especially appreciate Alex for showing up all the way from Australia. And as uh, you know, it actually happens to be summer in Australia, so to to travel from the Australian summer to to the European winter is uh, quite a sacrifice. And I think it's a, it testifies to Alex's uh, commitment to, <laughs> to this workshop. Thank you very much for being, the, for, for being here. We will uh, present on this panel um, a few case studies. Um, uh, I will start myself with talking a little bit more about the Czech Republic. And the uh, Czech Republic, uh, you know, it's not, it's not entirely, in my mind, it's not entirely an, a coincidence that Synopsis uh, came up in the Czech Republic, uh, you know, like this, uh, this research organization came up in Czech Republic specifically. I think there's a reason for it, and the reason is that the Czech Republic in the last, uh, let's say, seven, eight years, uh, has been a little bit of a, of a open space laboratory of Chinese influence and interference. Uh, and we can, I, I believe we can draw a lot of lessons from the happenings in the Czech Republic in the past few years, including various forms of resilience that uh, also became quite apparent uh, during this time. We have had a number of uh, almost textbook case studies in the Czech Republic of the ways in which the, the CCP interference uh, process materializes. Uh, we have had some spectacular revel uh, revelations in, in the Czech Republic, some uh, spectacular policy changes. So all this adds up for Czech Repu Republic to really be kind of a textbook case study for the topic at hand. And uh, I am here offering the Czech Republic as such, as a, as a, as a case to study um, uh, in, in the form of um, specific uh, individual cases, but also as a whole, as a, as a, as a, as a phenomenon, as a country level case of um, uh, Chinese inf interference and uh, the local institutional and civil society resilience. I think uh, I should probably briefly mention the, perhaps the biggest incident that we have had in the Czech Republic, which was also uh, an eye-opener for much of the Czech public and also for the political establishment. And that was the collapse of a Chinese company called uh, CEFC. Again, most of you may not be familiar with the name of this company or with the company itself, but in, in some quarters the company has become quite notorious. Uh, this was a, the, the company is now defunct, but uh, it was a company of some significance in its heydays. Uh, it was supposed to be a multi-billion dollar uh, industrial conglomerate that was listed uh, uh, on the uh, Fortune 500 index, uh, somewhere in the middle, so one, supposedly one of the biggest companies in the world. Uh, a company that supposedly had billions of dollars at its disposal, and it came to the Czech, Rep Czech Republic in 2015 and was hailed at that time to be the flagship of Chinese investment in the Czech Republic. So there were these huge um, expectations in the country that this one company, this particular Chinese company, would bring uh, investment significant enough to, uh, to impact the ma macroeconomic uh, uh, level in the country. The 
the impact, the influence, well, the impact was actually in the end minimal, but the influence uh, of the company was such that the Czech president even named the chairman of the company, Mr. Ye Tian Ming, his honorary advisor. So essentially, this, this one company, this one Chinese company, dominated the bilateral relationship between the Czech Republic and uh, the People's Republic of China for over two years, almost three years, uh, where it had all the doors open in the, you know, among the Czech elites, both political and economic. It uh, hadn't brought much investment um, after the uh, initial few spectacular uh, investment projects. There was really nothing much going on, in particular on the economic front. But there were um, hectic activities uh, elsewhere. The company established its uh, local headquarter in, in Prague called uh, CFC Europe. And it put directly on its payroll a number of high-level Czech servants and uh, politicians, mostly po former politicians, former politicians, but politicians still very well connected, up to the level of the Czech Euro Commissioner, so up to a very high level. And then in uh, late 2017, early 2018, the company collapsed uh, even more spectacularly than it appeared a few years before, than it had appeared a few years earlier. Uh, one of their representatives was arrested in New York and uh, accused and uh, later uh, convicted and sentenced for large-scale corruption uh, in Africa and in the United Nations. And Mr. Ye Tian Ming, uh, the chairman of the company and at that time the, the advisor to the Czech president, uh, was himself disappeared in the People's Republic of China by the disciplinary organs of the Communist Party of China. And then the company uh, turned out to be a gigantic financial fraud, basically a, a huge Ponzi scheme that uh, just kept borrowing money to offset its past uh, debt. And when the, when the leadership of the company disappeared, there were, of course, no more lenders, so the, the company collapsed uh, almost overnight. So that was a, that was a huge uh, shock uh, in the country. It was a, it was a very spectacular de development that uh, really pierced these, this, this bubble, this whole narrative of um, Chinese economic diplomacy in the Czech Republic. Uh, it did change the overall mood in, in, in the country. And uh, I think we can, we can witness the, the ultimate uh, repercussions of that, of that particular incident in the current developments in the, in the Czech Republic, where, as you know, a new government is coming in, which is very likely to change some of the, uh, or adjust some of the previous policies. Uh, so that was, the, uh, that was uh, I think, the, the most uh, important, the basic uh, development that, that really impacted the Czech Republic in this particular area. But since on the program I'm actually supposed to speak about something else, <laughs> I will also say a few words about uh, a recent incident that we had in, in the country. Again, a textbook example of something that is called in uh, expert um, sinological literature, uh, borrowed boats. So, borrowed boats. Uh, to borrowing a boat is a, is a Chinese. To borrow a boat, or to borrow a boat to go out to sea, to quote the exact uh, phrase, is a Chinese expression that is used for um, essentially localize Chinese Communist Party propaganda through local outlets th uh, in the target countries, uh, which allows the Communist Party of China to gain some local credibility because of course uh, you know the their their own uh, media mouthpieces um, uh, like the CGTN and, and other uh, big state owned chinese media are um, a priori uh, suspect uh, certainly in some parts of the of the population in you know outside of china abroad so very often what they do is that they put their content into um, a, a local vehicle. They just borrow, well, not exactly a boat, they borrow a medium. 
it's a it's a very common practice that we have seen in many countries. The the most uh, common manifestation is are the inserts that uh, the the Chinese state-owned media put into uh, regular media abroad, including you know very well-known media like the Wall Street Journal at one point, the the Times of London, and others. In the Czech case, uh, again, it was a it was a really textbook example of using this tactic when the uh, one of the mainstream Chinese uh, Communist Party affiliated media, Kuangming uh, Hrpao, uh, established a partnership with a local medium called uh, Literární noviny or Literary News, which is uh, a medium of some renown in the Czech Republic because it used to be the flagship publication of the reform movement in the Czech Republic in the 60s. So it's, it's uh, you know, it used to be a very well regarded uh, trusted uh, sort of high bro uh, Czech uh, medium, but after uh, after a series of changes of in in the ownership, it, act it actually ended up in the hands of a gentleman who used to be, um, uh, among other things, the spokesperson of the last Czech uh, communist prime minister. So uh, a gentleman with uh, with a very sp specific uh, past record. And uh, the, he established this cooperation with uh, Kuang Ming Zhaopao, the, the Chinese paper. And uh, this Czech, traditionally very well, very well regarded medium, then started to put out uh, uh, CCP propaganda almost on an industrial scale. Uh, it's, an, it's an interesting case. If you, were inter, inter, if you were interested in more details, we have recently published a case study about it uh, in the China Brief of the Jamestown Foundation. So I, I guess I probably shouldn't be taking any more time describing the, uh, the event here. Let me just uh, finish by saying that um, uh, in this particular oper operations and many others in the Czech Republic, the, the striking, uh, one of the striking features was that uh, we could see that um, on the Czech side, uh, the parties involved very often were people who had a history of uh, collaboration with the uh, Czechoslovak secret police, the, the STB, the state security, before 1989. So uh, it, it seems that uh, you know th this particular kind of influence operation uh, uh, can tap into and rely on some elements in the society that uh, are sort of a legacy issue from the pre-89 uh, times. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm uh, Alex Josky from Australia. I'm an independent researcher previously at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute where I've been working on China's overseas influence and technology transfer and espionage activities. And I'd really like to thank Synopsis, uh, the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute and ICDS for, but, and particularly Frank for bringing me over here, you know, over land and sea and then more land and <laughs> sea and then finally in, into Estonia, uh, where I've been welcomed by sort of the most snow I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> um, but I think one of the things that's left a, quite a deep impression on me is just how similar the discussion in, you know, whether I'm in Estonia or Singapore or in Australia is when it comes to China, how similar the problems we face are. So hopefully talking through some of the uh, developments in Australia will, will, will draw out some international implications that will be relevant to everyone here. So I'd like to start um, in Australia with a person named Huang Xiangmo. He was uh, a Chinese businessman who sort of suddenly showed up at the doorstep of Australia in 2011 or 2012. Back in China, uh, about a dozen of his associates had been arrested for corruption, uh, but he got a tip off supposedly, made it to Australia and established himself as a wealthy property developer, a billionaire and a community leader. Uh, very quickly, he started building up ties with politicians. He started recommending his friends as advisors and staffers to politicians. Some of his associates were even selected to run for political office by some of Australia's leading parties. And in the end, he gave $3 million uh, to Australian political parties. Um, he was really on a, you know, on a, on a winning streak. Uh, at one point, he had almost gotten Australia's Labour Party, one of our largest, our major parties, to shift its position on the South China Sea and say that Australia should stay out of it. Uh, when that didn't come through, he pulled back a $400,000 donation and ended up causing a, a little bit of a rift within the Labour Party where one key senator 
actually stood up in a Chinese language press conference and said, you know, Australia shouldn't be involved in the South China Sea. It's, it's China's internal affairs. It's nothing to do with us. So this is a really, really concerning example of the kinds of influence uh, that have been exerted on Australia. And it only came to an end uh, around perhaps 2018. Australian security agencies began warning political parties that this person may be working on behalf of the Chinese Communist Party. Work by people in government and in media started to actually shine a light on these activities. And then eventually, in I think uh, late 2018, Huang Xiangmo's visa to Australia was cancelled and he's now back in China, uh, living, in, living in Hong Kong. Um, but it's a remarkable case study. You know, someone who arrived in Australia and within just a few years managed to really insert himself into the heart of Australian politics and has been alleged to be working for the Chinese Communist Party. But this is just one node of an international effort by the Chinese Communist Party, something that's often called United, United Front Work. It's a tradition that goes back decades, uh, nearly a century now. So uh, you know, a year after the Chinese Communist Party was set up, uh, they began carrying out United Front work. They were instructed by the Comintern, by their overlords in, in the Soviet Union, to build a United Front of pro-democracy forces within China. And this tradition of finding groups outside the Chinese Communist Party, uh, finding alignments of interest, recruiting people outside the Communist Party, and uh, finding ways to expand that influence of the Chinese Communist Party across society and allow the Chinese government to claim that it doesn't just represent the 80 or 90 million party members, but the entirety of Chinese society. And now increasingly, that's including claims that it represents the entirety of you know, ethnic Chinese people around the world, including myself. Uh, and similar activities, uh, as, as Frank is going to talk about, have been seen in Estonia as well. But I think one thing that's sort of been missing here and something I've only recently started to understand is just that these activities were worse than I thought they were initially. So, you know, one of the things is that the United Front Work Department, this agency that carries out a lot of United Front Work, and a lot of the people doing United Front Work don't seem to be experts on foreign political systems. The core of their work is typically uh, ethnic Chinese diaspora communities. Uh, the Chinese government works really hard to try to co-opt and befriend the leaders of these groups. Uh, but that doesn't seem to quite explain how we're seeing more and more of these individuals jump from that Chinese community focus into politics, into you know, brazenly trying to influence Australian government foreign policy, into trying to you know, offer large payments of money to politicians around the world. And I think this is uh, a missing part of the picture that's just starting to become clearer, and that's intelligence work. That United Front work more and more looks like cover for espionage, professional spies. And again, this is something that's starting to be seen in Australia. Um, last year, uh, around the middle of last year, there was quite a high profile police raid on the residence of a politician, a sitting politician, and his advisor. His advisor, like Huang Xiangmo, had been an active United Front figure. He once bragged on his blog about how overseas Chinese have a duty to serve their country and use their connections to politicians like this person he was an advisor to, to push policies that will benefit China. And in its uh, search warrant, the Australian Federal Police alleged that this man, this advisor, was not just working for the United Front Work Department, but for China's Ministry of State Security. Uh, another case from last year, a man called Sunny Dong in the state of Victoria, um, very, very similar. Uh, he's currently you know, being prosecuted in court. And again, it's this charge that he's working for not just the United Front Work Department, but also the Ministry of State Security. So what, what, I mean, what is the Ministry of State Security? Why is it so different? And, and why am I so much more concerned about it than just the United Front Work Department? I think the key difference is this is a really professional covert and clandestine agency. Uh, this isn't just an agency that specializes in, in winning friends in diaspora communities. It specializes in suppressing dissent, uh, arresting and capturing the enemies of the party, kidnapping them, uh, in stealing government secrets, in carrying out cyber attacks against some of the world's largest companies and government organizations. And you know, most concerning to me 
is how it seems to be working through United Front Networks, through these thousands of organizations uh, around the world that over many decades now, the Chinese Communist Party has either created or built close relationships with. So what is concerning in itself, you know, the Chinese government's efforts to uh, influence diaspora communities is now becoming a platform to enhance the Chinese Communist Party's ability to do even worse things. You know, a, a, a springboard for espionage, for covert influence, for coercion, for kidnapping, um, and so on. And I think another aspect of it that I've looked at for this conference is how China's Ministry of Public Security, uh, which is often seen as China's police force, is also involved in this. And I think it hints at how much, uh, how well integrated intelligence is in the Chinese Communist Party's overseas activities. Uh, so China's Ministry of Public Security is unlike any other police agency, I think. And the best way to illustrate that is simply the fact that from the 1940s until the 1980s, uh, it was the Ministry of Public Security that actually handled a mole inside America's CIA. So what other police agency has moles inside the CIA? Um, and at the same time, it was uh, you know, running moles inside Taiwanese intelligence. It had entire divisions specializing in sending agents abroad. So this is not a traditional uh, law enforcement agency. This is an agency that, like today's Ministry of State Security, has a long, uh, deep, and proud tradition of espionage, intelligence work, foreign interference. Uh, so to sum it up, um, I think we're really only just beginning to map the picture, the landscape of Chinese Communist Party interference and influence. Two years ago, um, or for, for me, I think about five years ago, I first started looking at these issues and, and looking at United Front work. But uh, it, it's becoming more and more clear to me that I don't know very much, that there's so much more uh, to learn about how the Chinese Communist Party engages in these operations, who is really pulling the levers, who is giving the directions. And it's becoming harder and harder to find out because it's becoming more and more hidden, more and more clandestine, and I think thereby more and more problematic. So good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Matthew Johnson. I'm a visiting fellow with the Hoover Institution, and um, I'm a recovering academic. I spent a long time uh, studying the history and politics uh, of China uh, in the modern era, and particularly um, the People's Republic of China. And uh, these days, I spend a lot of time looking at the policies um, and uh, changes in and of China's political system so for an event like this, um, you know, the, the real reason why I'm here in Estonia, uh, in addition to having an opportunity to wear my warmest socks, is um, to present a uh, paper on, or to present research that I uh, carried out with um, the support of Synopsis uh, during a period of my affiliation there, um, looking at increasing engagement between uh, Chinese law enforcement organizations, agencies, and European law enforcement um, organizations and agencies. And so, as Alex has indicated, uh, you know, that's actually a very complex topic um, involving really a wide range of actors, at least on the Chinese side, but also uh, a wide range of actors on the Europe side. Now, I'm not a Europe expert, and a lot of this research, uh, particularly on the, the European side of the equation, was carried out by junior Sinologists and um, students of China's political system uh, who were working with synopsis. Um, so what I really want to talk about is the side that I'm more familiar with, which is the uh, elite politics backdrop against which um, 
Europe's increasing engagement with China is taking place. Um, now, I will say first that in this political legal sphere, which is the kind of part of the political system in which law enforcement sits within China, um, there has been uh, really deepening engagement um, with Europe within uh, roughly the past uh, six to seven years. So starting with a sort of commitment on both sides to uh, increase cooperation across uh, both supranational and uh, national law enforcement agencies in um, 2017, uh, PRC official Guo Shengkun Kun uh, signed an agreement with um, Europol head uh, Adam Wainwright um, to uh, expand uh, dimensions of law enforcement cooperation between Europe and China. And at the same time in 2017, um, there was also the beginning of a wave of new uh, extradition agreements between European countries and China, uh, which were documented um, quite well in, in a, a European Council um, of Foreign Relations study of uh, a sort of um, power audit, I, I, I think they called it, of Europe-China uh, relations. So this expanding cooperation has not been uncontroversial. Uh, people who are real experts on the topic, some of whom are in this room, um, have looked at issues like how the Interpol red notice system is uh, used by Chinese law enforcement agencies to uh, attempt to um, hunt down individuals on uh, political or um, religious grounds, so on the basis of identity rather than actual crime. Um, and there have also been uh, across um, a small but significant number of European states, uh, similar efforts to uh, extradite um, Chinese citizens abroad uh, through these cooperation agreements um, with uh, European national law enforcement agencies. So on that point, I suppose um, the takeaway or the, the, the message would be, uh, you know, that these agreements um, have consequences, and uh, for China, certainly, um, they are a potential source of uh, utility and also leverage in their relationships with, or in, in China's relationship with um, European states. So that's, that's, that's the law enforcement um, and uh, sort of um, more local side of the research, but again, um, it, that part of the project is still taking shape, and uh, to me, um, what I've been tracking most closely and um, what I see least reflected in the media, although organizations like Synopsis are really um, beginning to uh, change the balance here, is um, discussions of what this all means from China's perspective, and particularly from the perspective of um, China's leaders. So, you know, speaking to a defense and security crowd, I think we would want to know as much as possible about, you know, what the sort of signals are coming out of Beijing and why, you know, engagement with Europe matters, why uh, expanded law enforcement cooperation as a, as a kind of case study um, matters, and what China's assessment of uh, its relations with the broader world looks like. Now, the way that I've introduced this, I've already fallen into one of the biggest cognitive errors in the uh, sort of um, China politics field, which is uh, conflating China with the Chinese Communist Party and conflating uh, you know, the, the, the broader Chinese Communist Party with um, the views of its top leadership, and in particular, uh, Xi Jinping. So I, I would say that we need to be very careful about you know, who and what we're talking about here. So to, to be a little clearer, um, mainly what I would focus on would be, or, or what I will focus on would be uh, Xi, things that Xi has said, uh, and, and how they have kind of um, trickled down uh, or cascaded down through uh, China's political system. Now this gets at um, another point uh, that 
I did want to make at least uh, at, 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 at some point during these remarks, um, which is that Sinology obviously provides a pretty solid foundation for understanding uh, China, um, you know, starting with the language. But in my personal experience, uh, the, the, the work that I have done has only um, gotten better in my own view, or at least, um, you know, been uh, conceptually, I think, grounded in the kinds of issues and institutions that matter, as I have gotten to understand China's system much better. And so that's another point that I would want to make today, which is understanding Chinese and, and you know, being able to read Chinese, et cetera, very important. But on the other hand, what's also very important is being able to understand the more or less unique institutions of China's political system and what their respective functions are. And, and again, I think Alex gave us some sense of how um, unlike their analogs in uh, other societies they can be. With one important exception, with which one, one which I think many uh, in, in this country would be very familiar with, which is that China's system is not totally uh, sui generis or u unique. It's a, it's a Leninist system. It shares a common institutional and ideological heritage uh, with um, systems that existed within the broader uh, Soviet sphere and socialist uh, world of uh, the, the the 20th century, uh, uh, and you know, in, in the case of uh, China and some other countries, that that experience is not over yet. So, in other words, I would imagine that there are many experts in this country who uh, you know are focused mainly on Russia, for example, but whose knowledge about Russia would actually be very useful for understanding. Um, some of the some of the broader dimensions of the Chinese case. So I, I, I don't think in terms of starting to explore these questions um, that we're starting from zero at, at all. There's actually a lot of history um, to draw on and a lot of experience that, that comes out of that Russian focus. So to get back to um, elite politics in Beijing and um, the sort of backdrop against which European uh, or Europe-China uh, engagement, so to speak, has been deepening, there are just a couple of um, points that I want to hit here. One is that since Xi Jinping came to power, um, and we see this across documents and uh, statements that she has made, starting with his sort of inaugural speech in January of 2013. Xi's goal has been to, in a sense, rebuild socialism in China for the foreseeable future and to secure and enlarge uh, China's position in the world for the foreseeable future through what he calls a kind of long-term struggle between socialism and capitalism. So I think it's very important to keep in mind that these concepts, which may sound very dated, are actually very much alive in China's uh, political discourse. And you know, the litmus test, of course, is then how um, the, the party actually behaves, you know, whether this is all just kind of like rhetoric and actually she is some sort of a pragmatist, what, whatever that means. Um, but no, it, it seems actually that she is quite serious about all of these things. And you know, as someone who also has to study how uh, current regulations impact uh, financial markets, both in China and the world, I would say that we've seen all of the evidence uh, of this in great abundance in 2021 in terms of she's cracked down on capitalism. Uh, you know, an almost paranoid obsession with uh, data security and, and, and cyber security and part leading to the delisting of uh, companies like um, Didi Chuxing from the New York Stock Exchange. So however she thinks it is, you know, not as a capitalist or even a state capitalist. Um, you know, he's, he's concerned with the party. He's concerned with China's socialist system. He's concerned with its future. And that sense of um, mission and destiny arguably has only grown more intense since uh, the COVID-19 crisis, which according to Xi, uh, China has weathered um, admirably and has emerged from stronger. And as he said in January of 2020, um, you know, time and trends 
are now on our side. You know, our side meaning the Communist Party's side, because that's who he was speaking to. Uh, it wasn't for a general public audience. He was speaking to um, new uh, central and provincial level cadres. Um, sorry, new, new, um, yep, uh, provincial and uh, central level cadres uh, of the Communist Party. Again, um, you know, these details are important because the audience matters. There are different ways in which. Uh, Xi Jinping as a Chinese leader speaks sometimes for public audiences like at, at, at the G20, uh, but also you know internally um, to other party members. And we need to be very aware of those distinctions because the messages are sometimes um, often, in fact, very different as well. And so this sense of triumphalism um, really, one could say, uh, permeates Chinese politics right now. And even if you are a sort of rank and file party member and you don't believe it yourself, you have to behave as if you believe it because your KPIs, so to speak, are to behave as if you uh, believe it. Because this is, um, you know, she saying this is uh, how you as party members should behave as if time and trends are on our side. And so now you have to go out and figure out how to sort of actualize that reality in the world. And so, you know, I think when we talk about wolf warriors and, you know, we look at some of the strident rhetoric coming out of Beijing, um, you know, these, these seem very kind of ad hoc and um, reactive policies, but actually they are all linked um, to a much deeper effort to um, protect socialism and to, in a sense, extol uh, socialism in the eyes of the rest of the world. Now, this gets to another point that I want to make, uh, also related to um, Xi and kind of party uh, perception and party frameworks, which is that um, there is a real sense of danger uh, that you can get out of um, Xi's speeches. And this, again, you know, if you sort of start when he came to power in 2012, 2013, what was really on Xi's mind was the example of the Soviet Union and the crisis of faith that he believed led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. And this is very interesting. You know, of course, the economy mattered. Of course, you know, the kind of long-term military competition with, with, with NATO and, and with the United States mattered, but, um, you know, or, or, or the debacle in Afghanistan or, or whatever. But, um, you know, for, for Xi, it's this ideological dimension that is absolutely key to the survival of socialism in the contemporary world, and that's, and that's um, drawing at least somewhat from uh, the experience of the Soviet Union. Which is why, for example, all the defensiveness about history. You know, so she, she basically says that when, you know, uh, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union permitted the repudiation of Stalin, everything went downhill. That, that, that was basically where the, where the crisis lay, right? Uh, which was also what Mao thought, which is, you know, sort of an interesting parallel. Um, so, in other words, the party's survival and its strength really rest on its ability to control, you know, uh, not just um, what people do and, and um, whether or not they follow the party's orders, but in a sense to control what they think. And what all of this together means is this idea that I've been discussing um, at length with Martin and others sort of within the broader um, synopsis uh, group and then also here at this uh, wonderful event at ICDS um, and uh, uh, our other terrific hosts, including the Estonian uh, Foreign Policy Institute and, of course, uh, Frank. Um, but uh, the, um, the, the focus of that discussion has been to kind of try to get at how different China's concept of security is. And, um, you know, this, this obsession with ideology of Xi's really gives us maybe a kind of window on what security means from China's perspective. It's not just defending borders, you know, it's not just expanding uh, territorial um, claims, but it's um, being able to uh, assure the existence 
of a world in which the legitimacy of socialism as a system continues to be recognized. And this means, in part, then protecting the party from its political enemies. So once again, getting back to you know, some of these points that Alex was making, which is kind of a long-winded way of saying that when we look at what law enforcement cooperation between Europe and China means from China's side, the laws that are being upheld uh, you know, really start with the position of Xi Jinping and the Communist Party within China and assuring the security of the Communist Party with Xi Jinping as core. And so that is the baseline, as incongruous as it may sound, that is the baseline for law enforcement activity in China. That is what she calls you know, the DCN. That's, that's, that's the, the bottom line or the baseline. Which is, I think, worth thinking about, and you know, might explain some of the some of the some of the behavior that we observe um, uh, China's officials engaging in. Um, you know, it, it comes out of a fairly deep sense of China needing to be protected uh, politically, not just um, you know rounding up uh, criminals and 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 the corrupt who flee overseas, even though that's certainly part of it as well. Um, now, there is a name for this extrusion. So I, I um, you know, I live in steel country in the United States, so extrusion is a good verb um, that comes out of that heritage. But uh, the, the extrusion of China's um, political system into uh, Europe, which is 2018, which is the year in which uh, basically, China's political system, I think personally, went through a really significant transformation uh, to um, shift toward, uh, you know, really not just one party, but one person rule uh, in, in, in terms of the, the figure of Xi Jinping and, and uh, getting rid of any, um, you know, potential uh, obstacles to Xi's continued rule um, that might have existed in the Constitution. A new body was established called the, which is a, a, a party body, not a state bar, uh, body, called the Central Commission um, for Comprehensive Governance by Law. And this commission, which is chaired by Xi, basically directs the activity of all of China's justice and law enforcement and state security organizations. And through this commission, a very interesting new concept has been introduced, which is and, and, and introduced by Xi personally, which is foreign related rule of law, or excuse me, rule by, by law would probably be the more uh, effective um, translation. And so what this means is, in all the ways that I've just uh, you know, described um, by which China hopes to change the world ideologically to make it safer for socialism, you know, this is the beginning of, in, of a new initiative, arguably, to begin changing the international system legally to also make it more you know, safe for and compatible with China's socialist system, including you know, what um, she calls uh, being able to apply our own system extra uh, extraterritorially, so outside of our own borders. And I'm pretty much at the end of my time I'm just going to leave it there. I think actually, you know, this is where the conversation starts. I, I don't want to bring all the answers, but I think this is where the conversation starts, is about what these institutions are, what they do, what the concept means, you know, how we can continue to engage with China, but to do so in a way that takes into these motivations rather than just uh, taking at face value um, statements that deny their existence. So it's this sort of hidden world, uh, but you know, not actually hidden, just more difficult to access um, of elite politics, uh, change in China's um, political system, and change in the concepts by which uh, China engages with the world that I've tried to um, describe a bit here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, all the speakers, for your excellent um, panel.
Um, as I understand, a lot of research is still to be done, but uh, it was a uh, very good and very thorough insight into the issues uh, that uh, the community who's researching Chinese influence, influence activities has to deal with. Uh, very interesting uh, insight into China's threat perception that uh, and uh, the thinking in Chinese elites, heads, how do they perceive the West, and, and in a way also, how do they see um, the political stability and what might cause their turmoil or, or issues there. Uh, of course, uh, thank you for a very interesting uh, uh, explanation of, uh, and also, as I understand, something that needs to be continued to research on uh, how the different systems that uh, influence foreign audiences, how do they overlap, uh, what are their connections between there. And of course, uh, very interesting insight, how uh, former collaborators with an authorita authoritarian regime can become new collaborators. Uh, this, is, uh, this is very fascinating. So I'm sure the audience has plenty of questions. Uh, James Sher, please. Thank you. I can, I can only echo what Frank said. I'm, the, um, I'm, sen I'm senior fellow here and also uh, Frank's other half in our Russia-China project, which is underway. The present-day Russian official term for United Front activity is network diplomacy. And when Sergei Lavrov first articulated this theme in 1996, you won't be surprised to know that the dominant um, Western academic reception to this was very positive. Oh, look how sophisticated they are becoming. Um, despite the fact that we have had collectively now 90 to 100 years experience of United Front activity, uh, certainly with Russia and then also laterally with China. There is still an attitude of principled naivety about it which allows it to flourish. Now, I have a, this is coming to a concrete question. For every conscious agent of influence, there are a vastly larger number of people who would never consciously have anything to do with this kind of activity if they knew about it, but who are themselves propagating, replicating, disseminating the main themes, the main narratives um, of, this, uh, of this kind of diplomacy. And I would be grateful if any of you had a sense of give us a sense of how the Chinese view this relationship between the conscious incorporated agents of influence and the unconscious ones in society. If you could say anything about that, it would be very interesting. I think there's, there's actually a sort of concept in, in Chinese intelligence recruitment that lines up with that idea, and it's the different stages of recruiting an agent. And one of the last stages is that the term is something like, you know, your, your hearts shine out to each other, but they don't show. So it's that each of you kind of know what's going on and that you've got some kind of secret relationship, but you haven't actually acknowledged it to each other. And I think there are a lot of people at that level. But also, one of the key tools that, that China uses is simply access. Um, and it sees that that space below actual, actual recruitment of agents as, as perhaps the best place to work in for elite influence operations. Uh, so I think, I think there's a lot of pressure on Chinese intelligence agencies not to get exposed and to especially not kind of get themselves in trouble by pushing too hard on a foreign elite. So I think typically they'll try to just use positive incentives, trying to empower people, give them more confidence about their opinions in China and give them privileged access to information and individuals in China and use that to, to push, their, push their agenda. I, I think there's, there's another traditional term that <clears throat> describes this uh, relationship of uh, uh, 
you know, actual collaborators who may not be um, subjectively aware of uh, the significance of their activities, and that's uh, useful idiots, right? Uh, there's some scholarly discussion whether whether it was Lenin himself who used this term or not, but uh, it has been used for a very long time, and uh, I think its relevance remains. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sergei Metlev. I work at the Estonian Institute of Historical Memory and among uh, other topics we are dealing with international research of uh, crimes of communist regimes. Uh, it was really interesting to have this overview on the, how, how actually Chinese are penetrating the systems of the West. But um, otherwise I would like to um, ask you how about the penetratability of uh, Chinese government systems and society. Even when I think about the Soviet times, the West actually created a lot of uh, influence points, supporting dissidents, having radios, uh, uh, dealing with all kinds of sorts of intelligence gathering, uh, buying people in the Soviet Union, bringing them to the West and then having the information. It was a whole big system that was working for half a century to fight back. So how about uh, the possibilities of the modern West to fight back inside maybe sometimes this Chinese society? Alex, do you want to take sure. it? I think it's, it's certainly gotten um, much harder, I think, for a lot of the reasons that, that Matt was discussing, just the, the, the real increase in the politicization of China and this huge emphasis on party discipline and party loyalty and, and purity within the party, massive purges across Chinese society and the political class. Uh, so there, there have been some reports, for example, about how uh, CIA networks in China were really destroyed about a decade ago. And previously, intelligence agencies could take advantage of corruption in China. So you, know, you, you recruit someone essentially just by bribing them and then you give them money to bribe their bosses so they can get promotions. And you can essentially pay your way into making an agent even more useful. But I think a lot of those opportunities have really uh, probably become much harder to access. And I don't know if any of you want to add, add a bit, but I think a really key part is also the destruction of civil society in China. There's no sort of uh, mechanism and grouping for people outside of the political establishment in China anymore to really gather in a meaningful way. I think that, just to add to that, with a, with a personal um, anecdote even, uh, as an academic, um, when I was doing research in China, the early 2000s were like a golden era. There were archives opening, you know, there were all kinds of conferences. You could have discussions on all aspects of China's history. It, in, in, including the Cultural Revolution, which is now very much taboo uh, once again. Um, and that, that is really gone. Uh, and I think that um, you know, now academic exchange still exists, but it's much more tightly controlled. They're minders. They're people who travel along with uh, academic delegations if they travel at all, which they don't, of course, um, now because of the, the epidemic, but up until 2019, um, you know, uh, minders to travel with academics to make sure that they didn't say anything that they weren't supposed to say. And, you know, that's, that's a, 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 an encapsulation of the way in which um, discourse in, in civil society, as Alex mentioned, has been really closed down. And of course, now um, technology plays just an incredibly, I think, uh, critical factor in uh, making certain kinds of surveillance that weren't necessarily possible in the Soviet Union um, possible in China now. So um, really, the, the, the degree of closure, I think, is much more severe. Maybe, maybe one more remark. I think there's also a, a huge asymmetry in, uh, in the understanding of what constitutes um, uh, interference uh, in, in our respective systems. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a huge asymmetry because many of the activities that we consider to be a normal expression of uh, you know, free, free personalities are actually considered to be subversive by, by the Communist Party in China. Uh, particularly freedom of expression, and uh, there lie therein lies uh, a, a problem, right? Because it's it's in uh, in our societies, it's, it's very natural that uh, people would support 
uh, other people uh, uh, in their free expression. So whenever free expression is muzzled, for instance, uh, there would, of course, be protests from our society. And especially if uh, some of these freedoms are suppressed on an industrial scale, like happens in some parts of China right now, uh, specifically in the Uyghur autonomous region of uh, Xinjiang. So there's no way Western societies, with the principles they have, would not comment on what's going uh, in that place, because the, the violation of, of what we consider to be basic human rights and freedoms is uh, so outrageous that there's just no way we can keep silent. But if we don't keep silent, and we can't, the Chinese side takes that as, a, as undermining their own policies, and they respond to that. So I think there's, a, uh, th there's almost like a s systemic basis for some of the conflicts that we see happening right now. Thank you, thank you. There was a question, uh, Stephen. Thank you very much um, for EFPI to, uh, for organizing this wonderful panel. I've learned a lot from uh, all three speakers. Stephen Blockman's uh, SEPS Brussels. Uh, my question relates to uh, Dr. Johnson's invitation to continue the conversation on his last point, which is the rule by law, or should it be law of the ruler? Um, where do you see this going? after Xi Jinping's announcement a couple of days ago. Where do you see the rule by law developing steadily in China? And how do you think the US and in particular Europe ought to respond and prepare their defenses? That's, that's a, a magnificent and magnificently large uh, question. Um, so one conversation uh, that I've been having with others who are following developments in China closely is around whether it is not fair. And you know, I I, I want to um, broadcast first that I I don't think there's a definitive answer to this yet. But whether it is not fair to call China a dictatorship now, and what that would mean, whether the the sort of the figure of Xi Jinping is now so central to China's political system. And Xi's view of the world uh, seems so rigid with respect to relations between uh, China and Western liberal countries that it is difficult to imagine how engagement is going to produce much change in uh, China's international behavior, if any change whatsoever. I think already, um, you know, there have been groups inside and outside of China, uh, you know, who have very bravely put themselves on the front lines of issues such as human rights, et cetera. And that's, you know, been a, a, a fairly long story. But the, the question now um, that really does seem critical is uh, how much does China really want to engage, uh, you know, in particular with um, countries with more liberal uh, political systems, rather than just sort of relentlessly try to look for opportunities to uh, transform those political systems from within, which is basically, you know, much of the work that is, is going to be um, presented today in order to you know, in a sense, open those societies to Communist Party interests, to, to China's national interests. That's at least how I would frame the, the question. Um, you know, I, I think, at least among this group, the uh, uh, consensus would lie more on the side that um, what the sort of codification of Xi Jinping's uh, position within China's political system means is that we're going to see even more of these kinds of influence activities, even more of these attempts to, um, in some cases, you know, uh, subvert um, specific policies, if not uh, political systems. And that's essentially the future that one should be preparing for. Um, that's not a particularly pleasant future, so obviously uh, other alternatives um, uh, hopefully exist, but you know, it's, it's, it's got to be a two-way street. So I think the answer is probably like not what we can do more 
uh, in order to engage uh, China um, while ignoring these other, you know, sort of like real issues on the ground that are uh, hurting our own societies because that that relentless, uh, you know, kind of push outward is not going to go away, at least not while she is uh, ruler. It's at least, I mean, th there are many other perspectives on this, but that's where I would start. Thank you. And there's a question. Laura, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, just a, a comment, maybe. Um, maybe I'll turn to a question. But regarding the, the policing efforts and, and their cooperation agreements, which you touched upon, but which I think also uh, closely links to what um, Alex in particular was saying, um, is it, I mean, I, I feel that in everything that we've been saying, and they're building their influence, um, the security, the concept of security, which is basically party security, um, that you've touched upon. Obviously, through our work with Safeguard Defenders, what we've seen is that they've been massively expanding on this, um, policing cooperation agreements, multilateral judicial assistance agreements, extradition agreements, but where the focus really doesn't seem to be so much to actually get people back. Like we do see some cases, but like their extradition cases, formal ones, they're usually losing out on those ones and they're much more capable in doing involuntary returns, kidnapping people, harassing people to have them return. Um, but I think what we've increasingly been seeing is how they are really using this to crack down on dissent abroad and, and really attacking fundamental freedoms, especially freedom of expression and movement um, abroad. And, and I think this has been moving from, as they would say, ethnic Chinese communities, basically those that they do consider their subjects wherever they are, but increasingly also to the wider community of, of policymakers, of activists and so on. Obviously we have the examples um, where security services in Denmark and the UK actually warn some of their citizens not to travel to, to certain countries. But my question is, I mean, in every discussion that you might have in Europe with ministries of justice or, or even policing agencies, the same in Australia, like they are just very ignorant on this. I mean, they, it's really like the false friends narrative. They think, well, we're doing policing cooperation. This is the counterpart. Is there any movement on this is there what do you think is a way forward to actually go and inform these people which are not even the policy makers these are really just like law enforcement agencies which, which obviously are not used to doing international relations i guess whereas as you say actually the chinese prc law enforcement agencies very much are engaged in international relations and framing that if that makes sense Well, uh, I, I think it's uh, it, it's a difficult, difficult question, right? So, how how do you reach with uh, some of the uh, fundamental information analysis and knowledge? How do you reach into the depth of, <laughs> for instance, the civil service? Right. So the the way I mean, this this was one of the one of the rationales for creating synopsis to to get the information out, right? So we we do this by informing the public discourse, hoping that the message will eventually sink deeper and deeper into the state's structures. But that's just a very gen general and generic answer, I think. To get the message really across to everywhere where it's needed, that's, uh, that's a massive enterprise and that will take some time and a lot of effort and take some manpower. So we just have to, I guess, keep trying. There's, I think there's, there is just a lack of research on this at the moment, and um, I think Philip's presentation later will really go a long way, I think, towards building that evidentiary base that we need to not just show that you know, there are human rights abuses in China, but that the very law enforcement agencies that these police groups are engaging with are just totally different. That, you know, they, they, they think of themselves as political security agencies, and they have totally different principles that... Um, that, that should really be affecting cooperation with them. Dear ladies and gentlemen, we are very happy to have you back here, uh, physically present and hopefully also online, uh, to tune in to our second panel. Uh, 
uh, with the title Influence Operation as a Multi-System Effort. Uh, this panel will present new uh, findings, new case studies uh, to contribute to the understanding of uh, Chinese multi-system approach, uh, com combination of party state actors and their prox uh, proxies, uh, detailing their um, interaction with uh, parliaments, uh, politicians, uh, local level actors, and also uh, private sector. Uh, uh, this, uh, in addition to the influence agencies uh, in the CCP foreign affairs propaganda and uh, United Front systems, the study will also highlight the role of organs which uh, in the economic system, uh, notably the China Council for the Promotion of International Trade. Uh, without more further ado, I will first introduce the speakers in their speaking order, uh, Laura Hart. Uh, campaign director at Safeguard Defenders. Uh, uh, she um, acts as a, a regional li liaison for the Hong Kong uh, adv advisory group of Hong Kong Watch and also for the Parliamentary Alliance on China. Uh, she recently has co authored a study. Uh, uh, Conducted by the Global Committee of Rule of Law, of law uh, Rule of Law Marco Banella and Synopsis, uh, it's a case study on Italy uh, that he uh, she co-authored. Uh, the second speaker will be uh, Luca Sharek. Uh, he's an independent uh, China market analyst with uh, over ten years of experience in uh, working in the field in China and uh, uh, has produced many uh, uh, case studies uh, in related to Poland with, with collaboration uh, with Synopsis. Uh, next speaker uh, after Lukas will be uh, Filip Girus. Uh, he's a researcher at Synopsis. Uh, Philip uh, has graduated from uh, uh, graduated in Sinology at Charles University in Prague uh, with comprehensive study on United Front Work System, uh, uh, mainly focused on Czech, Czech case study. And he has published widely on uh, Czech universities' cooperation with the BLA linked uh, institutions uh, on CCP United Front Work System propaganda activities uh, in Europe. Uh, he has been widely cited in parliamentary debates, academic publications, and media investigations. Last but not least, uh, uh, Ralph Weber. Uh, sorry. Uh, Ralph Weber is an as associate professor uh, of European Global Studies at the University of uh, Basel. Uh, Weber holds PhD in political science uh, from University of Kolen. And his uh, research focus has been on uh, political theory, Chinese politics, and modern Confucianism. Uh, in 2020, Weber published uh, with Synopsis preliminary study on Chinese influence act activities uh, in uh, Swiss society, which uh, received widespread attention. So uh, now the floor is yours. Laura, please. Thank you so much, Frank. and. Uh Thank you to ICDS, the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute, and obviously uh, Synopsis for getting us all together here these days. Thank you for the people that came back after lunch uh, <laughs> to, to, to join us. Um, I also want to thank in particular um, my two co-authors um, for this paper that we just put out on Italy. As Frank already said, the paper is called Hijacking the Mainstream, CCP Influence Agencies and Their Operations in Italian Parliamentary and Local Politics. Uh, so huge thanks to uh, Yi Chang Lulu and Livia Kodorin uh, for bearing with me and, and, and for working on this paper for almost a year together. Now. I'm really happy that we got this out in Italy. Um, I think obviously a lot of us, um, I come from a political activist side, uh, and I think what a lot of us obviously 
see when we look at the China discourse um, within our own countries, within parliamentary debate, within media debate, we always have the impression that it's very bad and that possibly the country that we're living in is like the worst uh, in terms of exposure and influence. Um, there's a bit of hope maybe also there that you know we are really the worst, so people should pay attention and help us get over this. Um, but so what this paper does definitely and what is very important, I think, in, in trying to shape future debates within Italy and actually working towards um, concrete policy change, even more research, um, obviously it's laying the groundwork for that and a bit um, mapping out what is the reality versus what is the perception. Um, obviously, both within Italy, but also I think outside, and to a certain extent correctly so, uh, the perception has been that Italy has been very much exposed or at least willing to sign on uh, to a lot of um, PRC propaganda and geopolitical projects. Obviously, everybody knows that in March 2019, Italy officially signed on uh, with a memorandum of understanding to the BRI project. Um, Xi Jinping came to Rome for this. Um, this was quite massive, I think, because it's obviously the only G7 country that signed on uh, to this project. Um, following that, I mean, at the same time, we also had a huge amount of other memorandum of understanding signed that possibly and probably uh, have a much larger impact actually on the China discourse within Italy uh, and will also have a more, I think, um, you know, long-standing effect within society. Obviously, a lot of these agreements were supposed to be economic. We haven't actually seen any of that, um, you know, turn into actual investments on the ground for as much as we know because still most of these agreements are shrouded in secrecy, like nobody's actually seen them uh, fully. The same goes for the memorandum of understanding that was signed by the government. We still haven't fully seen everything um, that's in there. So one of the things obviously that we try to obtain um, as we move forward with this paper and try to push it within the institutions, especially in parliament for discussion, is to get actual insight into ac what has actually been signed on to, what has been um, discussed. Another thing very important that became very um, visible was that still in March 2019, basically 90% of Italy's mainstream media either signed on to an agreement, a content sharing agreement or a different kind of agreement with uh, CCP news outlets, counterparts or renewed um, existing agreements. So obviously all of this has kind of created a framework for the China debate within Italy, which I would still say is actually quite poor. There's little actual knowledge, um, and this is leading to, in the best um, case scenario, when there is actually some debate, we see it's a very polarized debate, uh, where usually um, also political parties or either right-wing newspapers against left-wing newspapers will kind of use the China debate to just shoot at each other and get some political gain out of it. But there's no profound um, research or study into what's actually going on. And so in using the synopsis methodology of looking at this systems-based approach, so starting actually from the CCP side of things, looking at their mechanisms, um, their agencies, being it, it in the foreign policy environment, the economic uh, influence agencies, obviously intelligence, uh, the more cultural uh, themed approaches, um, we've seen all of those present um, in Italy, but counter to what you know popular perception is, this is not a single party issue. This is not just um, what most people abroad will also have seen, just a five-star movement uh, issue. They have obviously been very open, at least their leader has been very open in um, marrying, let's say, the, the CCP propaganda and continues doing so. But what we found is that obviously there are also very long-standing historic um, ties within the Democratic Party. Obviously, some of those people come from the former Italian Communist Party, and um, I think there's been a decade long really laying the groundwork within Italy um, to kind of build up those networks, and they're very much alive. That's also something we still see in the media. But we have found people in all political parties, also on the right, 
the ones that obviously are usually, you know, they're very happy to shoot in, uh, their colleagues uh, in the in the left wing parties. Um, but we found that people all over the political spectrum have been in some way, be it knowingly or unknowingly, uh, co-opted or used at least in some of these uh, influence operations to really set the tone of the debate. I think what we found is that mainly the aim um, for as far as the political co-option goes is really uh, to set the tone of the debate and create this kind of new common sense of how we can talk uh, about China and um, it definitely, I mean, speaking from a perspective of on the ground perspective, it definitely work in the works in the sense that even the voices that are deemed critical um, of the PRC in terms like criticizing their human rights record um, or making some small comments, maybe being careful about uh, some some investments in certain sectors, still even those people that are seen maybe as more critical or even most critical um, within the debate are still very open to the idea, you know, all this, well, we do need dialogue, it's not that bad, yes, human rights issues within the PRC, but it's not something that's translating to here. So there's still a lot of naivety um, in the whole debate. And I think we can look at some recent examples just to highlight how that actually works and how it actually also makes Italy, I think, still um, some kind of a weak link in some of the more international cooperation networks, um, actually helping the CCP, obviously, in some of its geopolitical objectives. Um, just two um, examples, because they're tied to recent events that are still ongoing. One, obviously, um, you've all seen, I guess, yesterday, or I hope you've seen, the outcome of the Uyghur Tribunal in London, um, where the sentence, we can say, of this uh, People's Tribunal has been that um, beyond a reasonable doubt, um, genocide has been committed, I would say, is ongoing in uh, Xinjiang. Now, in Italy, it's interesting because I testified before the Uyghur Tribunal and the thing I highlighted was these press conferences that the propaganda department of the Xinjiang government together with the Foreign Affairs Ministry in Beijing have been setting up for almost over a year now and how they are you know, using these press conferences, one, to really harass, insult, attack the testimonies that have come forward uh, in, in these recent years, how they've been using forced confessions, forced statements, um, or at least what we think are forced statements, um, obviously by, by Uyghurs, um, by so-called former uh, trainees. Um, and how they've been really highlighting, you know, there's so much foreign press present. We've had 90 plus diplomats and foreign dignitaries visiting Xinjiang or, you know, following this. So there's a huge propaganda effort in this. Um, so I was very disappointed um, because of, let's say, also my, my personal interest in this matter. When actually the Italian parliament, I think, is one of the only, if not the only, Western parliament that has actively partook in such uh, a Xinjiang-related uh, conference entitled Xinjiang, A Beautiful Land. Uh, this was only about a month ago. Obviously, one of the people behind this was the uh, president of the Senate's Foreign Affairs Committee, who's a five-star movement um, member who has been very open, uh, obviously, in framing himself uh, in the political debate and in the media debate as someone who loves China, whereas, obviously, anyone critical of what is happening in the PRC, um, in his language, and, and, and this has a lot of echo, is an anti-China person. Well, everybody here uh, is, is accustomed, I guess, to those kind of uh, etiquettes. So this person, obviously, um, proposed this to the entire, to the Joint Foreign Affairs Committee of the Chamber and Senate. And while a lot of people within those committees were skeptical and were like, well, we should not be doing this, but still, and, and this is where the common sense comes in, right? Because he framed it as, this is parliamentary diplomacy. I and mean, we have discussed, you know, what is going on in Xinjiang. We have listened to the victims. So now we should also listen, you know, to the governmental side. Um, there is nothing wrong with this. Um, so, so we should do this. Um, Thankfully, some of the members in Parliament um, reached out to me and asked, you know, what should we do about this? And, and their idea was, well, we'll all go there and we'll just, you know, we'll say what we really think is going on in Xinjiang and we'll call them out on it. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to say I warned them. I said, look, if you go there, 
your statements will not carry any weight. Um, this is going to be a closed door meeting. Um, what you say is not going to be reported on, but you will create the image that the joint foreign affairs committees of chamber and Senate partook in this and, you know, are kind of um, legitimizing these, uh, these things. So luckily, most of the members did not go, but very disappointingly, um, the president of the Chamber's Foreign Affairs Committee, again, who is someone who's on human rights, I mean, he, he's a very credible person on human rights. Um, he will always you know, stand up for them. He has publicly called out the PRC ambassador in Rome you know, on their human rights records. So this is not a person that is like, you know, wanting to legitimize uh, these kind of things, but he went there. And so obviously what happened, that was, was very foreseeable, um, all Chinese state media, like immediately um, brought or um, reported on the fact that, you know, the joint foreign affairs committees of the Italian chamber and Senate partook in this, you know, Xinjiang related conference. Uh, Xinjiang is a beautiful land. We had a great exchange. Um, they understood our efforts against terrorism. So, I mean, the usual propaganda spin. But so it looks very bad, I think, for Italy to be involved in this. And I think also um, I was very disappointed that actually the president of the chamber's foreign affairs committee did not ask them to rectify anything. He said, well, I went there. I know what I said, they did not report on it, but that's fine. But through his, his, his presence, they actually were able to create the image that even all those members that had publicly abandoned, had, that had refused to partake, were involved. And the fact that he did not stand up for them, I think, um, begs into question uh, his position to a certain extent. So this is just one example of, of how, through some people that are more openly co-opted, um, but a lot of people are just like walking into the traps and, and luckily there's um, a growing awareness which obviously we hope to, to, to grow further. Um, just to say how does this play out also in the international scene very quickly, obviously the Xinjiang conference was something internal which the PRC can use for the propaganda. But if we look at for example the Beijing Olympics, we're seeing all these other countries actually debating a diplomatic boycott. Uh, we see a lot of the allied countries that have already decided on a, on a um, diplomatic boycott. In Italy, this is still not even a debate. Italy is still officially, uh, and Xi Jinping also in, in um, after some recent calls with Draghi has quite openly said it, Italy is still officially co-promoting the Beijing Olympics, because like obviously the next Winter Olympics are going to be in Turin in Italy. So they have this kind of co-propaganda thing still going on and it's not even part of the debate. Uh, we know at the, uh, the G20, I think in spring, when the forced labor um, joint statement was put out, that, um, sorry, the G7, um, conference that Italy was one of the two countries that actually refused, like put their veto on having the PRC expressly mentioned um, when it came to the issue of forced labor. We've seen the latest triennial plan. I mean, everybody thinks abroad there's a bit of perception that since Draghi came into the PM's office, everything's now so much better. Um, there's been a lot of reporting on some of the um, critical infrastructure that has been blocked, and I'll, I'll, I'll be concluding, Frank. Um, but I would argue that there's still been very little done. He promised when he came into office that they would be revising, at least review, the Memorandum of Understanding on the Belt and Road Initiative. That has not happened at all. We've seen the latest triennial plan that was literally written by the Chinese embassy uh, in Rome and just some small, um, you know, changes were made by Italy's foreign minister. But we can still see that a lot, like not a lot in the relationship has changed. And if you will bear with me, Frank, two more minutes, just I just want to go into a bit the reaction. So some debate has started. Um, what we were hoping for, I mean, we know that a lot of actually members of parliament as well and media were looking forward to this report. Now, I think a lot of members of parliament have been a bit shocked, like what we've had, the public re reaction has been a bit um, dead silence. Um, Obviously, I think, as I said, the perception was that this was a one-party or maybe two-party issue. 
But since everybody got named in this paper, I think the will right now to act on it um, is not necessarily uh, there. Everybody's a bit like looking at each other, what should we do? But so we will keep working on that. Uh, another thing, which I think again goes to that common sense um, that has been created, like this new ID, right? Like you're either with the PRC or you're with the US or, you know, we want to be a middle position. This is another thing that people like to say in Italy politicians. Like, you know, actually the US doesn't mind us being so much friends of the PRC because we can be the middle partner to, you know, do the dialogue. This is something that you will see in the newspapers time and time again. And there's just something very strange, I think, how it is still being perceived as a, we need to pick sides, but it's not really something that regards us. Like what I get a lot in reactions from people that do want to move on this is like they try to show how much they love the US um, as if, I don't know if it makes sense, but it's like they're really like taking this Cold War scenario and it's already in their mind. And it's like, this is not an issue of democratic resilience of Italy. It's not a question of the integrity of individual members of parliament or the institutions. It's not a national security issue. It's not, no, it's, a, it's very much an issue of, you know, where do you stand? Do we stand with China or with the US? And I think obviously that's something that we need to overcome because it's not a very useful um, debate. So I'll just, Leave it at that, and um, maybe we can have some more discussion later. Thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you, organizers, for, for uh, inviting me. I'm very happy that I have an opportunity to speak a couple of words about the situation in, uh, in Poland, and uh, I'm very happy to be here with, uh, again with the researchers uh, from the Synopsis Network. Uh, today I will be speaking, as uh, Laura was speaking about the politics, about Chinese influence uh, in, the, um, in the political circles. I will speak a little bit about the Chinese uh, presence, the presence of party state organizations uh, in the Polish economic sphere. And uh, there are there are various actors on the Chinese side that are involving in uh, conveying the CPC policies, economic policies to Poland. But I would like today to focus on the local party state actors. What I mean local is the <coughs> actors who have actually presence in Poland and not only just uh, organizing the conferences, seminars and that kind of events, but actually the entities that are present on the ground, which constitutes mainly of the Chinese, of the economic section of the Chinese embassy. But the key player on the Chinese side uh, is uh, our greatly cherished China Council for Promotion of International Trade, which has something to do with uh, international, uh, has something to do with trade, but not much with council. Actually, this is very nicely a uh, disguised uh, um, organization within the Chinese party state system as it is not formally within the structures uh, of the party or the state system, but it's affiliated to them, it's guided by them, and in some ways controlled on them, it's connected with the, by, by the people uh, related to the party. So by every mean, CCPIT is the tool in the, C this, in the CCP foreign economic policy. There are, of course, other actors, uh, actors that will not be mentioned here, like the uh, China People's Association for Friendship with Foreign Countries, which is a great organization, and uh, I had the pleasure to write about them. Uh, but uh, CCPIT, for now, can be considered as a key local part state actor that tries to be a mind bridging organization, mind, bri mind organization bridging economic contacts, and the first point contact uh, for the Polish partners. And their role is multifaceted, but one of them is implementing CPC economic policies. For years, there have been tooting the Belt and Road Initiative, and for years there have organized various delegations, uh, events on the subnational level, uh, which 
would look like that the bunch of Chinese companies from the construction sector, uh, exporters, uh, were coming to Poland trying to penetrate Polish market, but actually they were very little active on offering the investments or export opportunities. So it was like still implementing the policy of going out of export expansion with no regard of the Polish interest or very, very little regard. And CCPIT, as I said, is a local organi organization. Because they have presence in Poland, they have the, the Warsaw office, quite active. Uh, the, mem the employees, members of this office, uh, take part in various events, in uh, economic congresses in Poland. They are present. Some of these congresses are actually co-organized by CCPIT, or even uh, the, they are tempt. They are Chinese tempt congresses. And the CCPIT managed to convince uh, many Polish actors that they could be the valuable partner. The point is also that <coughs> Polish enterprises, Polish business chambers, and Polish business community was not very difficult to be convinced that CCPAT is a good, uh, it could be a good partner because uh, Polish business for years have been so eager to boost the cooperation, economic cooperation with China, uh, to draw the Chinese investments, uh, to expand exports that neither business community uh, nor the uh, administration, uh, no, no, nor the uh, government administration or government agencies didn't much care about the origin, about the background of the so-called economic organizations that were involved in bridging this cooperation. Uh, the exam uh, I will be speaking about some cases which could illustrate how successful was uh, the CCPIT in this narrative of being the great bridging organization. They convinced the Polish partners on many levels that they could be valuable partner. One of them is uh, the one of the greatest uh, business uh, associations in Poland, employers of Poland. Uh, they say to represent or have to ha, have connected the network of 19,000 enterprises employing 5 million people. Uh, their objective of cooperation with CCPIT was to facilitate the access to the Chinese market for the for the members for the associated associated companies. Mm, uh, actually, employees of Poland have quite a long history of interactions with the Chinese partners, but here the personal this, the personal thread. Uh, can be observed. Uh, the bilateral relations uh, well, were greatly boosted after the former PAI head, who was organizing the Polish stand on Expo 2010, 2010 and who was, later, who was later the PAI head, and who established the special, special cell in the PAI that was headed by the Chinese national uh, for boosting the um, cooperation of the Chinese partners became the presidential advisor of employers of Poland. So he was the one of the key people who encouraged employers of Poland to intensify the, co the cooperation with the Chinese partners. Uh, Mr. Sławomir Maiman is uh, quite, a, quite a person, uh, very well known in Poland, and his history would be very interesting. Unfortunately, we do not have uh, much time for details. Uh, but in 2017, the CCPIT signed the agreement of, co of cooperation with employers of Poland. And soon after that, Mr. Maiman uh, happily represented, uh, uh, represented the organization at the uh, Silk Road Think Tank Association uh, conference. That, w that has very little to do with the export, even less to do with the Sorry, uh, very little to do with the boosting of uh, the co economic cooperation. That was an example how the engagement of the very large Polish business association was leveraged by the Chinese side to spread its propaganda, to use the Polish company as an example of the engagement of the valuable foreign partners uh, in their international efforts. Uh, the another example is the China ASEAN Expo, where uh, employers of Poland were one of the uh, partners. And actually, it was also very, very funny, as in 2019, 
uh, this organization signed a cooperation agreement as the first European organization. They were they became the partners of the China ASEAN Expo, which was greatly, uh, which was uh, great leverage in the Chinese party state media as the success of this initiative, which is strongly supported by the CCP leadership and uh, Xi Jinping uh, himself. Uh, so no, unfortunately. Uh, the employers of Poland also were active in disseminating uh, the CCP-sponsored information and abuse of the Chinese economy. They had a bulletin on Chinese economy, which it was just simple copycat of the information fed by the Chinese uh, economic section of the embassy. This is a little bit embarrassing, as this organization has very fine economists on board. They have very fine analysts, and in spite of that fact, they just, because of this agreement, because of meetings with the economic, uh, with the economic advisors at the embassy, they just republished uh, the texts that, way, that they were fed by the embassy. Um, Mr. Uh, the, um, the very unpleasant, I would say, uh, example of the Convenient of, of how the authorities of this organization are, co are convinced to cooperate with China is that is that the, uh, is that uh, they openly spoke for the access of Huawei to the to the to the to the building to participate in the rollout of the Polish 5G network. Another uh, another interesting organization, but a little of a different profile is the business associations focused on China. So the business associations that are established to boost the export co to, to cooperation with China. One of them is Polish Chinese Business Council that was established by the members family of one of the wealthiest Polish businessmen, Jan Kulczyk, and the uh, chairman of, uh, for a couple of years, the chairman of this organization was his daughter, Dominika Kulczyk. This organization absolutely relied, in the first years of their operation, absolutely relied on CCPIT. They signed the many agreements with local branches of CCPIT, Hainan, Hunan, Hubei, uh, name them. And actually, after a couple of years of that cooperation, not many substantial results of the cooperation came out, but their engagement was again leveraged uh, by the Chinese side to entangle them in the participation in uh, the Chinese initiative, international initiative that would boost the CCP's position uh, as the in the legal uh, in the legal network, something about uh, Matthew uh, spoke about in the previous uh, panel. Uh, so uh, except for that, this Polish Chinese Business Council was very active in facilitating interactions on uh, on, uh, on everyday level between the Polish between the Polish businessmen and the Polish officials, and also they tried to boost tried to boost still presence in academic circle organizing the special competitions for the best master thesis on Chinese Polish co Polish cooperation, as well as they also co-organized the China talks with one of the Polish universities. Three minutes, and <coughs> last but not least, we have. Now in Poland, the Association of Chinese Enterprises, which is an organization that is managed by CCPIT, guided by embassy, and has not much to do with the business chamber as we could consider that uh, in, as, as other uh, European business chambers are. This organization is focused on establishing relations with Polish actors from public and private sector to meeting Polish officials, to providing the support to the Chinese companies, trying to the Chinese companies how to better penetrate Polish market, which is understandable, that could be, uh, which any other, any other chamber would do that. But also, this chamber is providing the, is, is a tool for the control over the Chinese enterprises in Poland, over the, the activities, and, and it helps coordinate uh, their operations. Uh, the chamber also issued several statements. Usually, this chamber doesn't speak for single Chinese enterprises. However, they make an example for Huawei, and in the last two years, they issued a series of comments, series of statements on supporting Huawei's uh, engagement in the Polish 5 uh, 5G network. And finishing, uh, finishing my presentation, why the CCP, CCPAT is so attractive partner? Because it promises the network of uh, partners on the ground in China. It promises access to prospect in Bertos. And they are also the great 
partner for the small Polish companies, not only big, large organizations, not only governmental agencies. They just help them, they just help cutting transaction costs, but with no real effects. But the people are looking only on costs, not often looking at the effects, uh, and they looked at the CCPAT can help them to support uh, operation establishment in China or that they can sometimes cover part of the expenses. Uh, there are two case studies, but we will skip them and you can find them in the article sometime, hopefully sometime later. Uh, conclusions. Uh, the Polish business community, Polish government agencies, actors, unfortunately heavily rely on Chinese party state organizations and mainly on CCPIT in trying to boost their cooperation with China. And they are not much, uh, not much initiatives to circumvent those organizations and to try to establish the relations with a Chinese business partner in other way in other ways. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. um, is that working? Yeah, cool. Uh, thank you for the floor. Thank you to Frank, thank you to FPI and uh, ICDS for organizing this event. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Um, I will now sort of follow up quite a bit on what was said in the previous panel because uh, my presentation will be on the PRC security system and its interactions abroad, specifically looking uh, at the Ministry of Public Security, which has been already mentioned here several times. Uh, I will look a little bit at some internal reforms of the ministry and try to sort of draw the conclusions in the terms of what are the consequences for international cooperation, specifically looking at Europe. So as it was already mentioned in the previous panel, uh, the, the, I would say the key issue and the Western approach towards this entity is that not only the governments, but quite often even the security forces perceive MPS as simply the police ministry and is taken as a standard analog to uh, our police forces as we understand them. But the issue there is that uh, it is unlike our standard police forces, not only because it has a history of doing intelligence, counterintelligence, political policing, but because it has continued to do so, and uh, it's especially on the political policing, let's say, it's been actually increasing its activities. And uh, part of the presentation will be uh, actually focused on how they are now basically saying it openly, even though that uh, in the sort of, uh, let's say, post-Tang era, there was a, a sort of renaming or sort of rebranding of the system to look more Western, let's say, perhaps. But now we're back to basically very, I would say, Soviet examples of how to do uh, policing. Uh, the issue also is that what, what Matt said in his presentation is that um, even the political and uh, legal cooperation has now been perceived by China as, as for some years, but increasingly since 2018, as a tool more to sort of change uh, how standards and norms are done and set in the West and international bodies, and use these bodies again for basically uh, political policing, for uh, basically um, abusing the system to arrest dissidents, to arrest members of of groups such as Falun Gong or ethnic, ethnic groups such as uh, Tibetans or, or Uyghurs on trumped up charges uh, of either economic criminality or, or terrorism in the case of, uh, of people from Xinjiang. And as you can see, this is actually from data from the end of 2020. Uh, you can see that, uh, I'm sorry, this is EU focused basically, but somehow even the UK got in. This is, uh, uh, this is a report by Merix, uh, just to, to make sure where his source is. Uh, but as you can see, 
uh, all of the countries there have some sort of cooperation with the PRC. And I'm now saying PRC even though it actually differentiates between Hong Kong and the PRC, but I think at this point we can say that after uh, 2020 there is no clear distinction between PRC and Hong Kong uh, judicial and uh, security system anymore. And actually, technically, by passing the Hong Kong national security law or state security law, you could say that this can now be technically used for extradition uh, of of people all over the place for completely ridiculous uh, issues and minor criticisms. Um, so the cooperation is quite widespread. Uh, and it's not just the MPS that is part of this. It's the whole political and legal system uh, that uh, is part of this uh, uh, cooperation. I mean, there are more sort of police-focused cooperations that Matt talked about, like trainings with Europol, or um, exchanges on the on the floor or on the platform of Interpol, and uh, also uh, at the UN uh, police uh, conferences and missions. It's the MPS that is present, but it's uh, several other uh, central level organs that actually are, are part of this cooperation uh, that uh, are present. But I will not really talk about. I'm just wanting to make it clear that this is not just the MPS. It's actually a complex system, uh, and it's probably worth sort of looking at these agreements uh, with Hong Kong and with the PRC, and whether they actually still stand, whether can they have been or can whether they can be abused for political reasons. Because the other issue is that the security system in China has become increasingly political. Uh, it has always been political to some degree, but I guess we can say. Uh, that in recent years it has become ever more so. Uh, we've also uh, seen issues of extradition of Taiwanese nationals to China, uh, be it for actual uh, sort of charges in China or simply because states do not really differentiate or do not accept the existence of Taiwan, so Taiwanese nationals would be repatriated to the PRC where uh, quite a few of them can face uh, very harsh conditions uh, simply for, for being Taiwanese nationals and in many cases critical of, of, of the PRC. Uh, similarly, this is uh, data by August 2021. Uh, these are the, uh, I believe, ongoing cases of uh, extraditions and deportations in the EU. So these issues are happening, whether they are successful or not. Uh, this is uh, this is still creating a lot of pressure on the on the com on the let's say uh, exiled communities in Europe. And they, a lot of these things can only happen thanks to those agreements that are signed between the countries and that are often pushed by uh, those organs such as the MPS, especially I would say in recent years, even though after 2018 or 19 countries are now sort of more sensitive to that, but we've seen sort of a lot of debate on like joint sort of counter-terrorism debates or in the case of Serbia, even trainings. Uh, and uh, of course, those cases of uh, police presence in like Italy, Croatia, the joint patrols that again is MPS. Um, and also what MPS has been active, as I already mentioned, is uh, UN, uh, UN platforms and UN missions. Uh, this specifically from 2004 in Afghanistan, which I guess will now come in handy. And uh, the question is like, to what degree this cooperation, because we know that uh, there has been a circle of people in Afghanistan spying on the Uyghurs from the PRC security system, to what degree these missions can also be again used uh, to spy on people who are targets of, uh, of the uh, let's say political policing again. Um, but to use the proper term, uh, I should not say political policing, but political security protection, or sometimes referred to as political protection work. Um, uh, as mentioned previously, this is a, an old Soviet or Czechist concept uh, that uh, the CCP learned in its early days from, from the Soviet Union, uh, has had um, trainings by uh, Soviet advisors in that regard, and um, MPS has always 
since uh, the establishment of the PRC, has always been uh, the entity to uh, engage in political security protection, which uh, basically means protecting the regime from internal and to some degree external, uh, external threats. Um, this has been uh, mainly the task of the first bureau that we will talk about here for a bit, uh, which actually is arguably the largest bureau within the MPS structure uh, and also the most powerful. Um, this bureau, uh, which uh, up until 2019, we can say until, 2000, uh, until May 2019, uh, uh, was, called, uh, was called Domestic Security, Bureau uh, has by, at the latest May 2019, reverted to its old name, which is Political Security Protection Bureau, uh, even though that this, this, has been not, this has not been really made properly official uh, in the sense that you would see like coverage in Xinhua or Ramin Repal on, on this name change, but we have central level and local level documents that clearly show that this has occurred and has been implemented. Uh, because to understand, it, it's not just the central level ministry, but it also operates or at least should supervise units to basically the county level within China, uh, including in Xinjiang, where actually uh, some, uh, structures of, uh, some structures of the uh, public security in Xinjiang have been even sanctioned by the EU. Um, so this is, has been definitely even raised up within the EU circles. Uh, but it's now clear that this entity is now subscribing back again officially to those old policies. And this should clearly sort of send the message of uh, how this is not just the police force, how this is actually now, and like one of the key tasks is actually fighting against evil cults, which uh, means today not only Falun Gong, as that was sort of the the original idea, but also Christians. We have evidence of even like local level public security agencies raiding Christian homes and then bragging about it on social media. And, uh, and uh, they're also running like the, the other issue of the sort of ex extending hands of the, of the PRC security and, uh, and legal system is um, that they're now, they have been active in getting um, sort of, or even kidnapping people that are targets from foreign countries, as well as coercing them to, to get back and, and get uh, prosecuted back in China using all manners of, of blackmail. There's been cases in the US that have, have shown that. Uh, part of it is, is the sort of uh, strangely, or I mean, at least in some circles, strangely named uh, Operation Skynet or the Skynet system, which uh, seems to be still ongoing and uh, if anything, uh, increasing. But just for the last point, where why uh, this is also relevant to Hong Kong and again, to all those agreements that we have signed with Hong Kong, is the fact that the first bureau has been very active, again, an entity that has been active in political protection work even despite its name. Uh, there's been no sort of uh, seizing in those operations. It has been very active in Hong Kong. Uh, we can actually see clear links between uh, the extradition bill proposed first in, in February 2019 and public security uh, events and conferences uh, in, in, in the PRC. Uh, and as for sort of the last point, when in 2020, after the national and uh, the state security law was passed, um, and the new basically secret police, if you will, office was established in Hong Kong, it was staffed by, by two, uh, by three high ranking officials. Two of the deputies, deputy directors of the office were uh, an MSS officer already sanctioned by the US uh, that I will not talk about, but the other person was actually coming from the first bureau uh, and is currently operating as a deputy director of, of this office in Hong Kong. And that is Li Xiangzhou, who has sort of passed the, the sort of, has sort of gone under the radar, not really noticed by, uh, by any governments, including the US, which is focused on the MSS. I would again say to some degree, because MSS is perceived as the intelligence, MPS again as a police force, 
which I hope that this presentation sort of showed that it's not, I mean, it is to some degree a police force. I'm not denying that, but it's so much more. And uh, I think, again, it's, it's worth revising all those uh, cooperation agreements um, or do, do a lot of due diligence on any new agreements and, uh, and perhaps also look at this, uh, this operation in Hong Kong where we have an MPS officer from the Political Security Bureau uh, actually now basically working against, uh, against dissent in Hong Kong and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Um, thank you, all the organizers. I'm happy to talk to you. I'll have to preface this with, I saw on the program that this is supposed to be about Northern Europe and the Baltics, right? And then I thought, I'm safe. There's Italy on here and Poland, right? But then I saw Philip's map. <laughs> and on that map, I thought, OK, what I, do I do now with Switzerland? It's the white spot in the middle that you saw. And I think it's my task now to make sure that you don't think that's terra incognita. But <laughs> I didn't mean to say that. It's just a rather interesting conflation of Europe and the European Union, which we in Switzerland quite sensitive about. Anyways, <laughs> so I want to talk about Switzerland. I can talk about Norway also, if that is um, de demanded, maybe in the discussion afterwards. But Switzerland is an interesting case, maybe also because it is not in the European Union, but it has some features that are very attractive for the things that we talk about here. And this is partly based on a study that I did with Synopsis um, and published last December, which was called Unified Message um, Rhizomatic Delivery, pointing to the fact that although we see different systems and we heard already about some of them right, at, at play here. The message that goes through these different systems is astonishingly unified because it's top down, right? it's copy paste to a large degree. It's not much creativity what concerns the message. The channels, however, are very complicated. And that's where the resume comes in, an idea of not everything will pop up everywhere. Something pops up here, there. It's actually hard to reconstruct. And I think part of our discussions are about getting clarity into that side. Right? Ideologi ideologically, the matter is pretty clear. The channels of transmission and those are that's really tricky. And I think we heard already some very interesting remarks in this sense. Now, in the study itself, um, I, I had two parts. One part was really interested in the Chinese diaspora in Switzerland, which you can imagine is pretty small as in many European countries, but big as in Australia and Canada and other places. So the situation is a bit different. And I think in my study, I could give a pretty comprehensive picture of the associations that we find in Switzerland. I would think about 70, 80% I probably got in there, right? Now, these are cultural associations, like, um, chambers of commerce. There was in 2016 an effort um, through the Chinese embassy in Switzerland to put up an umbrella organization over all of this other associations, which semi-functioned. There was some quarreling going on that we could see, so interesting things to see there. But the Chinese diaspora, if it comes to the overall impact on Swiss society, I think is a minor force, right? The second part was about Swiss elites, um, social, economic, political elites, and attempts at co-optation of them. That's where in Switzerland a lot of things happen, so I could not be comprehensive in any way. My experience rather was and is whatever I take into my hand in Switzerland, I do find these connections. Right? And, and the lesson from that to learn, I think, is we should presuppose those connections. It's important to see them so we can qualify them. But the problem itself has not yet been answered what that means. That's another discussion. One thing is to show their connections. The other thing is to evaluate them and tell and understand what that means. Or doesn't mean also. Right? But that's where I think my, my study has still maybe bracketed out the most sensitive areas within Switzerland, which is pharmaceutical, um, chemical, right? It's the finance sector and it's the university sector. Now, when I said that diaspora is of less impact, there are few areas in which it is important. And there's an overlap between my first part, the diaspora, and my second part. And these overlaps, they're actually quite interesting. That's um, some channels that led into Parliament, Swiss Parliament, into trade associations, and the third thing was science and academia. So that's why I'm focusing now in a follow-up work on actually that part. Now, if you look at science, there's again many different parts one could look at, right? And I'm just focusing my remarks 
on, on one aspect, and then I have a little add-on just to give a bit more concrete life to what I'm talking about. But within the science realm, there's one discussion, and there's a lot of discussion going on in Switzerland, but also now in Germany and other places, about Chinese scientists in our institutions. Right? That's a difficult discussion to lead because one must be very careful not to see a suspect everywhere, right? But also careful enough not to be naive, and navigating that is, I think, a challenge and a task we're all facing. What we can show also, and that's what I will show afterwards, is it's not just the people in the institutions. There's associations around in our countries and in Switzerland, certainly, that are very crucial if it comes to knowledge transfer attempts, right? If it comes to normalizing the PRC as a science actor, these sort of things. The other thing is talent recruitment programs that I want to mention. There's a lot of them, and Alex Josk, who's spoken this morning, has done a lot of um, good work on this, right? And has shown plenty of them at work. And, and, and I will show that um, I actually found many more with regard to Switzerland that are of interest. But there's two sides to that. So one is an effort of getting people back to the People's Republic of China. And the other one is using the people who are abroad. Right, and I have a quote here for you, and it's one from a two th it's often quoted actually, but it's from a 2013 speech by Xi Jinping at the Western Return Scholars Association, which is a United Front Work Department organ, right? And it's already one that has a huge Swiss chapter, by the way. I think around 600 people that are in the People's Republic of China, but are involved, for instance, in talent recruitment in some places. But the quote in his speech from 2013, so right at the beginning, right, is, is the following, and let me read that to you. That quote, the party and country respect the choices of overseas students. If we return to China to work, we will open our arms to warmly welcome you. If you stay abroad, we will support you to serve the country through various means. Everyone must remember, no matter where you are, you are sons and daughters of China. End of quote. Now, I'm looking at that passage for some time, right? And the choices that the party respects, I'm not quite sure. It goes to support, right? And I think it goes to incentives and it goes to pressure. There's a whole spectrum of things which can be behind that word of choices there and support. And the second thing I'm not so sure about is whether the choice is actually just whether you want to serve abroad or at home <laughs> and not whether you want to serve. Right? It's this sort of areas I think we want to, to think about and if you then look at a country like Switzerland, I think this is partly copy-paste to other countries. You will see that there are, the embassy often plays a crucial role when it comes to the science sector and other sectors too. But in the science sector, certainly the party plays a crucial role. You have student organizations. In Switzerland, at every university, you do have a student organization, a CSSA, right, as you have in most European countries. What I found out in, in my investigation in Switzerland, some universities are not aware that they exist. Others, they're registered with others, and there's a distinction there that I think is interesting. And it's important for university leaders to understand that such an institution is there, because it's um, funded by the Chinese embassy. And the third institution there is um, CASTS in Switzerland, the Chinese Association of Science and Technology in Switzerland, which also copy-paste exists in many countries. That's a triangle, because they work closely together. The students will work for CASTS, right, and they will meet at the embassy, and there's nice pictures, and so on. So that is, um, I think, a circle. What, now, for, by country by country, I think it's interesting to look at the sub-organizations of that organization. So CASTS in Switzerland has a, a series of them, and it's material science and energy technology. Another one very similarly called material science and just technology. There's finance, life sciences, and you can already see from there what's of interest right in Switzerland. Then I, an, an aspect that I think we sometimes ignore at our own peril is to um, look at transnational organizations, right? not just at country-level organizations, and it, I think it's very important in the European context. One of them is the Federation of Chinese Professional Associations in Europe, registered in Frankfurt am Main in Germany, and as many of these organizations registered as non-political. And it's important because this organization, together with CAST, so the Chinese Association of Science and Technology in the mainland, is operating what they call um, high chain innovation and entrepreneurship bases. There's only um, one in Belgium, was the first one, and these two actually opened one in Switzerland. 
And my feeling from what I've read is there might be one that just opened in Sweden, but it's something I would have to corroborate. But I came across a reference and I thought I should tell it. And what that is in the end is a talent recruitment, among other things, a talent recruitment station. Now, talent recruitment, one thing is you receive delegations, they come to our universities and they give speeches, so, and they introduce um, the, the monetary and other incentives that they can give to people who would want to come back. Right? That's the most innocuous way, but that happens. And talent recruitment station is a, a based on an, an actual an agreement between a, a Chinese part, which usually often is at the municipal, city, provincial level, right? and some actor on the other side. And when I did a little bit of research into Switzerland in this regard, I found a good dozens of, of such events, and that a large number of them, such agreements were signed. And they're not just signed, they're not signed with universities as a counterpart, but they're signed with um, student associations, again, and they're signed with, um, um, what is that, like a, a private company that serves as a recruitment station, which I think is interesting. And in earlier years, many, some years back actually, there was such an event done by the People's Liberation Army itself in a Swiss university, one of the big ones also. So these are the types of constellations that we're finding. And I think it's worthwhile for um, universities to investigate this. I will say maybe a lot of the word why that is so important. But let me go to a different area briefly, cooperation. Right? It's something that's very sensitive for universities. Because if you want to do top global science, you need to cooperate. And scientists will tell you you need to cooperate with the People's Republic of China. But cooperation in this system always means cooptation also to some degree, whether you want it or not. There's no way to go away around that. And it puts up a real dilemma, I think, for our actors. One aspect that I've found often is co-authoring especially in natural sciences and in technology studies, right, where you have authors at our institutions that collaborate with Chinese-based authors. And if you look at the affiliations, it's sometimes directly leading into the Chinese military. But if you interview the people on, in the European actors in this, they have no clue about these institutions. Right? And that is not a, a very scandalous thing. Right? But it's a thing that could lead to something. And I think that's a logic we're still not understanding quite enough what actually happens before a scandal happens or really something happens. There's a lot of surreptitious things that will maybe lead to something, maybe not. And that's massive in volume. I think it's something we need to understand better. What does the result of that in, in, at that also maybe discourse level mean? And I have two examples that I wrote with me. One is an institutional cooperation of a big Swiss university with an, a university in Shenzhen, right? And what you find there is a, a very renowned professor who serves as a director of that corporation. There's a Chinese director and one from a um, um, Swiss university. Now then, I, um, I looked into this, right? And I found the same person or at an online event organized by the embassy student associations and castes, so that triangle I was talking about, talking about the 70 years of relations, I'm sorry, of good relations between the PRC and Switzerland, since we were so early in recognizing them, right? That's the event that was celebrated around and also celebrated there. And now this Swiss scientist, right, that professor shows up there, and, and what he says there is basically um, just, and I quote him here, that the, um, he was Lord praising the Belt and Road Initiative. It's not his field of expertise, to be clear, right? But praising the Belt and Road Initiative, of which he called a good example of China's persistence in seeking long-term development and win-win cooperation, and which he entirely and strongly supports. It's not his field of expertise, and that, I think, is a result of such corporations and into the problems they might put you in the end, right? Because you're then enlisted and you're helping to fortify a message that then resounds through that, those systems. So that's a loudspeaker problem that we often have, like messaging that goes out and discourse that is changed. The second example is a bit more academic in that sense. It's from another university, which has a cooperation with the University of International Business and Economics of China. When you looked at the cooperation partners a little bit more in detail, and I put that up for you, Lukas, <laughs> the, one of them was actually on the expert committee of CCPIT. <laughs> so there's connections on in between the systems again, right? That, that's why it's important to disentangle all of that. But what I found there is something 
quite innocuous at the beginning, but it's just an academic work um, uh, on the Sino-Swiss Free Trade Agreement. Switzerland's very proud to have signed, not as the first, Iceland was first actually, <laughs> but on the continent, right, the Free Trade Agreement, which is um, a joy and a burden maybe at the same time. But they published an academic evaluation report on this. So I thought that's interesting, I should read it, right? And it's co-authored by a scholar from that university and one of the cooperation partners out of, of, of China. And in there, I just read that passage to you and I want to see whether you react as I did react. But there's a sentence in there which reads um, verbatim, we take the position that nothing is not an option, that China is sincere, and that the world actually needs the BRI as a complementary framework to existing ones. Now, you can have different opinions about the Belt and Road Initiative, and there should be academic freedom even to state such a position. But that China is sincere in an academic evaluation report? What does that have to do in there? And you know, I would take offense similarly if it would have been the white spot on the map. Switzerland is sincere. I don't know what that would mean, academically speaking, right? And so it doesn't make sense like that. And it's in, on top a bit questionable, since China is sincere, that the Chinese propaganda is repeating over, all, over and again. And that makes it into an academic report. So I think these are surreptitious ways where you actually find good starting points for inquiry. Right? And you see problematics that are not that easy to solve, right? because it, it has actors who are really having a hard time positioning themselves. So what should be done? I have three points that I want to advocate that I think um, should be done, and they should be done in, in almost like that order. <laughs> the first one is to, um, to know the CCP and its systems much better. Right? And, and Synopsys has been a wonderful resource with uh, some of the best people in the world right, to work for Synopsys, and they understand those systems and know the context to ask if they don't understand. And it has been a completely um, wonderful experience to work together with them. But that's what we really need, first of all, understanding those systems. The second thing is then to really know what is the case in our own countries, in our own institutions. So if I'm the leader of an institution, I should want to know what sort of things are going on in my institution. And that's not easy, because you run against um, legal borders also. You cannot go around and ask professors about their personal relations to this or that, right? They will resist, and rightly so. And the third thing then is to take measures. Once you understand the systems, you know what's the case, then I think you're in a good position to take measures. Right now, because we got so much awareness about China this and China that, I think a lot of actors just want to jump to step three. And that's a disaster, because you're basically flying blindly and now trying to think about measures, which might mean that you're just scandalizing things that are not a scandal, and you don't recognize the scandal that stares at your face because you haven't done step one and two. Right? So I think we should really keep to that order, in a sense, and take the time. There's some measures that can be done immediately, but other measures, I think, really need time. And, and my last point there is I think that it needs to be, and that's the sort of a dilemma, a liberal democratic reaction. Because it's very tempting right, to react to this sort of authoritarian challenges in an authoritarian way. And you see that in, in Germany recently, the Minister for Research and Education has apparently written a letter to the university leaderships telling them to look at their Confucius Institutes and draw the right conclusions. And how did the universities react? As they should, by saying, we are autonomous. <laughs> Don't tell us what we should do. You're exactly doing what the PRC is doing with their universities, right? And it puts up a real dilemma. How can you bring liberal democracy actors to act politically without forcing them to do that? Right? We are back into some riddles of political philosophy and history where we had to force people to be free and so on, right? which is problematic and we know where that can lead to. So I think we need a lot of brain power to come up with the idea of how to act within the bounds of a liberal democracy but still be effective and not run into a dis systemic disadvantage in this sort of constellation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for an excellent panel. Uh, thank you for excellent um, advice on uh, how to approach the issue we are facing. And uh, without the research that all of you are doing, this, uh, this is just exactly about the first Ralph's uh, advice. Without looking into the systems, uh, about how they operate, uh, who do they target, 
Uh, without that, uh, we are just uh, flying blindly. Uh, and uh, excellent examples from Italy, how the uh, politicians, parties are targeted. Uh, and uh, in a way also very um, vocal or very clear about how we lack knowledge uh, in these issues. Uh, politicians thinking that they are just practicing party-to-party -party politics or, or parliament-to-parliament -parliament, uh, interactions. But uh, if you know the Chinese party, party state system, this is not the case. Or even cooperation in law enforcement, uh, in police. Uh, while we think that we, they are uh, modeled after us, uh, no, that's not the case. Uh, not at all. Uh, the same applies for the economic cooperation, uh, li uh, like highlighted uh, well by by uh, Lukas. So, so um, there is there's lot to lot to investigate. Um, I'm I'm hopeful that you have a lot of questions. <laughs> Thomas. Yes, hello, uh, Thomas. I'm live just some, uh, um, with the ICDS here. Uh, actually, I have a question to each of the panelists. Am I allowed to be that kind of uh, ex expensive in my? Please, All right, uh, good. Be my uh, guest. Uh, I'll start with the with the with the, with the reverse order, perhaps. Uh, the case of uh, Oliver Gerber and the University of St. Gallen. Mm -hmm. uh, you spoke about the measures of response, you know, and, and the, the professor who dismissed him basically as a PhD student for, for the tweets mm -hmm. uh, wrote uh, in, uh, in her emails basically was demanding for the Haas student to self censor. I mean, you don't need to be uh, an expert on Chinese politics just to understand that it's not right mm -hmm. to do in a democratic society. So, uh, is she, does she has still have a job as a professor <laughs> in that university? Well, simply, you know, what kind of measures do we take in, in, in protecting our own values when, when it comes to that? Because she, well, she was afraid of losing her, her visas mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to China and be able to, to participate in the scientific projects uh, with the... Chinese scientists. Mm -hmm. Then uh, perhaps to Laura Hart uh, uh, regarding it Italian landscape. Is there a correlation perhaps uh, between the uh, sort of muted, uh, rather muted reaction from the Italian society to the findings about the Chinese influence over politics in Italy, or penetration of Italian politics, and uh, the uh, generally the attitude of Italians towards politics, you know, seeing it a bit of cynical eyes that it's you know, so anyway corrupt, anyway there's a sort of big money slushing around, so nothing much changes just you know another you know dimension added to that but generally just a kind of a might be a correlation between between the attitudes political attitudes of a society towards mm -hmm. the democratic politics and the Chinese influence or, or your findings on the Chinese uh, influence and then to uh, to to Philip uh, I, uh, on your map I, I I saw Lithuania having and I, I'm a Lithuanian and I'm sort of keenly observing what's happening you know between Lithuania and China these days I noticed that Lithuania has a, an extradition treaty uh, marked or colored as a, as having an extradition treaty with China uh, uh, as one of the countries in yellow you know on 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 the map with, now with the, with the situation deteriorating and so on do you think that among the tools that Lithuanian government would, or should actually even Looking at how you know it's, it's trying to develop relations with Taiwan, should that treaty be actually uh, 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 sort of uh, cancelled, or the parliament should renounce it? You know, as, as, as no more, no longer valid. You know, that's that's a question because the next next time you know somebody goes after a Taiwanese national residing in Lithuania or visiting Lithuania. We, we might have uh, uh, issues. And to look at uh, uh, Poland, uh, there was a flurry of activity in the early of 2021, very high level activity in between Poland and China. Uh, 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 diplomatic activity and then policy activity and then so on, which sort of uh, uh, made po uh, Poland a little bit of a um, Deviant from this kind of a general transatlantic position that, that China is, is is a strategic problem or challenge, and and uh, 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 also in a bit of you know gave a propaganda fodder for Beijing to say that uh, look not not everything is going down the hill in the 17 or now 16 plus one format, and we are building such wonderful relations with Warsaw now, and so on. Is there any debate in Poland, you know, where, or regarding the wisdom of this course of action, which probably had certain tactical reasons behind it in relation to Washington, Berlin, or whatever, uh, 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 but still, because it probably makes quite an awkward uh, discussion now in the bilateral Vilnius-Warsaw format, you know, that we're, uh, uh, with Vilnius standing at one end of, you know, China, China relations and policy, and now Warsaw emerging has got a bit friendly face uh, with, re with regard to Beijing in, in, in the region. What is the situation there? Thank you. 
Should I pick him? <laughs> or shall yeah, we? It's okay. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, Oliver Gerber, which is not his real name, right? It's, um, it's an interesting story, and I followed it very, very closely. And, and But you ask what, what to do in such situations, right? And how could one do something? It's important that um, what the, that university did was, was um, eventually two things. They um, commissioned a report on that case. Um, and then they commissioned the report on the entire university's relations to the PRC. And that was actually part of the second report there. Right? And, and the second report, I thought, was a very good idea, something that I think many universities should do. And it's exactly to avoid such a situation and to avoid the situation where you could have checked what is the case at your institution, then you don't do it, and you can be sure you will find out through the newspapers. Right? That's not the best situation. So I think it's actually quite a good idea that they did that part, right? Now, the, re the results are out now. So the, the first report that I wasn't part of uh, came to the conclusion that it wasn't the tweets, or not the tweets only, it was a destroyed relationship that goes back wrong, um, longer. Now, from my point of view, from what I know about the case, and I must be sure that the person who looked at it knows more, Right, um, I would have come to slightly different conclusions. The, the conclusion, or the report um, reaches the conclusion that this sort of direct Chinese influence was only there in the heads of the doctoral student and the professor. Now, there for me, the story begins, doesn't end, right? Why is it in the heads of these two people? And I agree with that conclusion, by the way, from what I know. We know that it was triggered by uh, some other doctoral student in Canada who sent an email or he's tweeting terrible things to that professor. Why does a student do that? And I think it's an important systemic, systematic point. We don't know, right? But one could easily assume that it's self-initiated, right? But it's not self-initiated because somebody sits there and thinks, oh, that might be a funny idea to do. But one thinks, oh, that might help me, that might um, be the right thing to do. There's a whole range of motivations. But I would assume it was self-initiated, right? But now what's the discourse like? that the doctoral student and the professor both think that there's direct Chinese influence here. Right? That is something we need to address. And that's also why your second point, why that does that person still have a job? Yes. And, and I think partly I would say it's right. right? Because I, I, I actually spoke out in the press on this also the next day when the story broke. Um, that we should not do a witch hunt here. Because that would portray the problem as a morally particularly weak person, right, who does a wrong judgment, and then you have this sort of disaster. Whereas I think it's not about the persons here, it's the structures that are important, and it's not the only case that goes in that direction. But if you individualize it on that person, we're missing the point about the structure. So I think the problem is bigger, in a sense, than that individual person. And from a university point of view, I think, what can we do about it? I would have thought that it should have been a system in place where, as a professor, you cannot just <laughs> put an end to a doctoral student by one day or the other but that you would have to report to a commission that say, oh, we want to end that, right? That would have taken out speed, and speed is a loss of the essence here for an overreaction for what I can see. This is institutionally very easy to solve, right? And you can have committees where dependencies are... So there's a lot of academic stuff you could do about that, which I hope will be the, the, um, the, the lesson that will be learned here. So it's also about, although in this story, the doctoral candidate is the, is the main victim, right? He has lost the academic perspective completely through that thing. But it's also institutionally speaking about protecting the professors or to not do stupid things. Right? That should be our interest too. So there's a question of sensibilization again, of, 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 of understanding what is a threat, what isn't, and so on. So to a little extent, it's two victims there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, regarding Italy, I think, well, one, I should say, so the official muted response, I was obviously referring um, to, to the policymakers. I mean, this was a policy brief. Um, so it was mainly directed at them, and there we've had an officially muted response so far. Uh, that's not to say there have not been quite some frantic calls uh, in the background <laughs> going on. Um, when it comes to the general public opinion, 
I don't think it's so much related to what you would say regarding corruption. That might have come up in some cases specifically with, you know, when the corona, when the pandemic hit. And obviously we've seen all the story. There was the massive propaganda from the PRC on, on Italy, on the so-called aid packages. Um, there's also been quite some smaller corruption things going on, or at least being investigated with particular people that link to several parties um, engaged in the mask business at that time and that might have made you know, a lot of money on that. So those things are going on, but they're not really a part of this debate, I would say. Um, in general, foreign policy debate is not very much alive in Italy, especially in the media and especially among the public. So again, since the pandemic hit, China has kind of become an issue that people do talk about. Um, up to two, three years ago, that was basically non-existent, except for maybe in that you know sort of common sense discourse of you know huge trade opportunities, huge economic uh, opportunity. We need to dialogue. We need to engage, and you know um, things will go better. This was obviously pushed once again by this kind of yeah you know, political forces, but also media. Um, again, it was the, 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 the common sense being pushed. I would say um, in general, as I, I tried to highlight before, uh, what is still really lacking is one, the knowledge. There's a huge knowledge gap, but also the understanding that this goes to the heart of your institutions, of your democratic resilience. Um, the same goes with the media, actually the whole exposure of media, all the, you know, the myriad of agreements that have been signed there. And some are pretty profound. Um, like if one of your, like two of the main news, national news agencies have an agreement with uh, Xinhua and, and, and one of them actually, ANSA, which is the main one, is constantly, like if you look for China, nine out of 10 news items will be literally from Xinhua. And of obviously, I mean, it does state that but, you know, in a very poor media environment already, um, where foreign policy is not really a forte, I mean, it just kind of creates this, you know, main discourse where, yes, there's some critics, and, and this paper obviously is then being seen as, you know, these are the extremists on one hand, where you have the pro-CCP people on the other extreme, and but the real debate is somewhere in the middle, and nothing is really being done, again, unless there is some foreign pressure telling them, oh, maybe you should check this out. And then we go into the discourse of, oh, but, you know, yeah, we, we, we are a firm partner in NATO, we love the US. And so it's, it's not a mature debate, I would say, in general, um, and also within Parliament. And I guess for us it was important to, to show that this is something that involves everybody in the hopes that this will make people actually get together and say this is something we need to address together. But I guess as a first impact it may have had the opposite effect that everybody's like, oh, I did not want to be named in this, so let's, let's stay away from this. But again, it's, it's going to be, um, I think, long-term work. Thank you. <clears throat> right, so to your question whether the extradition treaty with the PRC should be suspended, the short answer is yes. The sort of longer answer is that I would say at this point, with all the recent changes and the long-term developments, all such treaties, not only with the PRC, but with also Hong Kong post-2020, should be suspended, or perhaps better terminated. Uh, because I would say that the international community and the governments, not only in the West, have been failing at protecting people who are targets of this political security work or basically people who are critical of China in their own countries. And this is simply tools that are very easily abused uh, by the PRC organs. And I would say it also, in especially smaller countries, it sort of m puts a lot of pressure well, not only on the community itself, which is targeted, but even on the like officials who have to deal with those kind of uh, mechanisms. They get political pressure from within their own structures. There's a big country that is telling them you have to extradite this person. And uh, I would say that quite easily this could lead to a lot of trauma and, and damage that is simply not necessary. And uh, for like, as if I maybe I'm not a legal expert, but I understand that extradition can be done even outside of these extradition treaty systems. So there's no reason for for us to keep them. And it's actually, at least for me personally, it's sort of outrageous that we have not suspended these agreements, especially with Hong Kong after what happened in 2020. Some countries did, and it's definitely commendable. 
Uh, but I was, when I looked first at the map, I was sort of uh, frustrated that it's sort of not only us in the Czech Republic where this has actually been a debate, but how many countries in Europe have sort of kept those agreements going. Uh, because again, I don't really see the, necessi the necessity for that. I only see, again, and it's not me, it's the PRC that sees this as something to exploit and we should just not give them that opportunity. Okay, so my turn to understand. Uh, well, this is a very long question that would require a very long answer. I will try to make it very short. You did not mention specific events, so I assume that you refer to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs visit to China and the President taking part in 17 plus 1. That was the first part of the year, but the second part also had some signals sent by the Polish government. Uh, like the invitation of the Chinese enterprises to build Polish infrastructure by, by minister. And later in October, the, the, uh, Poland uh, issued uh, the Panda bonds in China, which very few countries uh, uh, has done so far. So we became again the member of this very small and narrow political club, not financial. Uh, is it a shift? I think that it should be put in the context. So there are some signals and uh, there are some steps on the side of the Polish government to make the relations with China warmer, <laughs> closer, but still, if we put it into the context of the events of the last past year, uh, past, uh, past years, like the 2015, 2017, the great romance of the Polish, gov Polish government with China, still we are far, far away from that. I, 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 I'm not from government, so I, will, I cannot I, I answer you what is the government policy. You should ask the relevant uh, ministries and relevant organs. <laughs> but uh, um, one thing in your question was that transatlantic relations. I think that we also should look at the lenses of intra-EU relations, not only transatlantic, to look for an answer why there are some steps taken by Polish government on that side. And I think that we all know <laughs> what is it about. It's about the, some frictions, political frictions between uh, the current government in Poland and the uh, EU authorities. So it's not only through the lens of translating. I think that intra-EU also, also play an important, uh, important uh, role. Is there a debate? Yes, there is. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and, but just summing up, there are more and more and stronger voices for coming back to the closer relations to China because of economic reasons. So that's like the short, short summing up that we have, that we have our export to China growing, and that we have this railway connection, and we can earn on that, or we can earn on the railway connection. So there is debate, and of course there are pro and cons, and and this is ongoing. But the debate, the most important debate, is within the government who shapes up the policy. And there are also different voices from the government if you, list, if you read the media reports. But what will happen really, I think that also depends on the political situation within the government, within the ruling coalition. So I hope that I addressed your question. If not, I'm still open. <laughs>the different actors in Chinese party-state system and uh, their, um, their activities in targeting uh, the Nordic Baltic region societies. Uh, without much further ado, I will introduce the speakers in the order of speaking. Uh, the first speaker will join us uh, from Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, his name is Per Nuren. He's an independent researcher focusing on Chinese industrial policy and the CCP's influence work. Um, his writing has been published by the Swedish Center, of uh, for, Swedish Center for China Studies and the uh, Swedish Defense Research Agency, and also in Jamestown Foundation China Brief. 
uh, Bar holds a PH, uh, BA, sorry, bachelor degree from Uppsala University and an MA from Stockholm University. He has researched the C CCP's influence activities uh, in Sweden as a non-resident fellow uh, at Synopsis. Uh, the second speak, uh, speaker in the uh, uh, evening panel will be uh, Justina Rajumaite. Uh, uh, she studied at Vietautas Magnus University and also at National Tsung uh, University in Taiwan. Actually, we studied in the same university in Taiwan, uh, just different times. Uh, since 2011, she worked as a diplomat at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, of the Republic of Lithuania, while uh, still maintaining close connection with academia by giving lectures at the East Asian uh, uh, lectures on East Asian politics at Vilnius University. Uh, and uh, the last speaker will be <laughs> me myself. Uh, I'm uh, uh, Estonian Foreign Policy Institute's uh, research fellow, uh, focusing on Chinese, uh, China, uh, China-Russian relations, um, uh, also uh, Chinese interest in the Arctic, uh, and most recently on Chinese influence activities in Estonia that I hope to share with you all today. Uh, without uh, further ado, I will give the floor to Per, please. Thanks so much, and uh, thanks so much for having me today. I'm very glad to be able to join virtually uh, and to be able to sum up uh, the findings of my upcoming report on the CCP's influence work in Sweden. Um, not too long ago, um, before the recent events involving Lithuania, which we'll hear more about, uh, there was a time when Sweden used to be perceived, at least here in Sweden, as um, one of the more heavily targeted countries by previously state pressure, at least among uh, European countries. And of course, there were a couple of drivers, uh, major drivers for this. Um, the big ones include the kidnapping of a Swedish citizen, uh, Gui Min Hai, who was a publisher based in Hong Kong, um, and was kidnapped during vacation in Thailand in 2015, uh, and has been held in captivity in China ever since. Another major driver was, of course, the uh, Chinese ambassador to Sweden, Guo Songyo, who made a number of inflammatory remarks, uh, including explicitly threatening remarks uh, during his time in Sweden before he left about a month ago. Adding to that, we've had cases of espionage against Uyghur and Tibetan residents here in Sweden. Uh, we've had a few cases of seemingly uh, successful cases of political pressure. Um, for example, there was uh, a planned exhibition, a photo exhibition by the United Nations Development Program, which would have included photos of, among others, Ai Weiwei and uh, the Dalai Lama, which uh, was cancelled somewhat mysteriously, presumably due to pressure from the PRC states. Uh, Additionally, uh, a hotel here in Stockholm uh, refused to host Taiwan National Day celebrations, reportedly due to pressure from uh, the Chinese state. So with all of these uh, events going on, public sentiment here in Sweden towards China have uh, turned in a very strong negative direction. Uh, surveys show that Swedes have stronger negative sentiments toward China than uh, most other countries in the world, uh, second only to Japan. And also, uh, when asked about their views about world leaders, they have um, among the most negative views about Xi Jinping, again, second only to Japan. Yet, despite all of these things, uh, there are wide, widespread grassroots influence activities going on here in Sweden, um, uh, affiliated with the Chinese party state that have not um, received much attention, um, not so much in Sweden or internationally for that matter. And there are some of these activities that I'm bringing up in my, in my report, uh, and which I will very briefly uh, mention some of them today. <laughs> so these sort of activities include um, clusters of businesses, chambers of commerce, cultural association, Chinese language media uh, and other organizations that work in collaboration with CCP actors to promote 
the party's ambitions while being based uh, here in Sweden. And so one of the groups that I write about in my report uh, is what I call the Ye family network. So the Ye family has been instrumental in setting up a number of organizations that work to favor uh, to promote the party's interests. Among them, in 2005, they set up uh, the so-called well, Swedish China Council for the peaceful promotion of national reunification, which is, of course, uh, similar to other sort of reunification councils uh, around the world, which are affiliated with the United Front Work Department. The Swedish uh, organization was founded in 2005. Some of those individuals, just a few years later, uh, founded uh, what was called the Swedish Chinese National Association, um, seemingly or nominally a cultural organization, but one that has also filled a political purpose. Uh, according to Gui Tsongyo, the ambassador, uh, the Swedish Chinese National Association is the backbone of the Reunification Council. Uh, so they, they certainly think that having this sort of cultural organization that can mobilize parts of that, the diaspora is important to rally around uh, the undertaking of the reunification. Later on, some, again, some of these same individuals uh, in the Swedish Chinese National Association uh, worked together with the China Chugung Party to establish uh, what became known as the Nordic Chugung Association. So the China Chugung Party is, of course, one of China's so-called uh, democratic parties that in practice work in collaboration with the Communist Party uh, and uh, work to rally different groups, primarily in China, but also uh, internationally uh, to support the party. Now, the China Chung Party is particularly focused on individuals who have spent time overseas and also individuals with expertise in science and technology. And the same is the case for the Nordic Chugung Association, which recruited a majority of their members, uh, including people with PhDs. Uh, and the organization bore all of the hallmarks of being an organization set up to facilitate tech transfers. I also write in my report about Chinese language media in Sweden. Um, the largest one of those things that we have here in Sweden is called the Nordic Chinese Times founded by, uh, by a person named Robin Ho. In his own telling, Robin Ho founded this paper after having been uh, dissatisfied with how the Beijing Olympics in 2008 uh, were covered internationally. So he set up his own paper uh, to tell a good story about China uh, and has ever, ever since functioned as a propaganda channel here in Sweden. Uh, working in close collaboration with, for example, the China News Service. Um, Robin Ho has described his own work as tunnel warfare and organized activities to, for example, uh, whitewash the treatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Now, uh, some of these activities that I've described are primarily focused on uh, diaspora and have been conducted in Chinese, and which is probably why they have escaped uh, attention in Sweden. Now, in a uh, uh, somewhat unusual case of actually the United Front Work meeting politics in Sweden was uh, a few years ago when it uh, became known that a municipal councillor uh, in the Nacka municipality in Stockholm uh, was involved in a group that advocated for uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, this municipal councillor uh, named Lydia Liu uh, was um, later on confronted about how she could both work for a Swedish party, the Christian Democrats, a minor centre-right party here in Sweden, and also um, advocate for this uh, PRC state initiative. Uh, the party not long thereafter expelled her, um, but in addition to what was uh, covered by Swedish media, uh, it turns out, and as I write in my report, she has actually been involved in a lot of other organizations uh, that work in close collaboration with organizations sub uh, subordinated to the 
United Front Work Department. Um, including them, uh, she's worked very closely with the All China Federation of Industry and Commerce and working as a sort of local liaison uh, with a um, Chamber of Commerce here in Sweden. She also uh, received strong support from um, the organization I just mentioned, the Swedish Chinese National Association, uh, which supported her. And um, in one media statement, they claimed that they had the ability and the will to bring together the Chinese, Chinese diaspora to electorally support certain parties or individual candidates. Uh, there's, there are no indications that that actually happened, that the diaspora was mo mobilized that, that way, uh, but it certainly shows the sort of mindset that some of these organizations have. Uh, and so, uh, well, the report goes through many other things, but I won't have time to go through them here. I'll just uh, end briefly um, by saying that some of these uh, activities have been able to take place uh, largely because there's been very little knowledge in Sweden about United Front work or how the Chinese party state uh, exerts influence uh, on a grassroots level. Uh, so, um, well, this is probably largely due to the fact that Sweden has, uh, in security policy circles, largely been focused on Russia and has been studying that. Um, and the fact that the Chinese party state could be able to organize um, on this level in Sweden is something that has only recently been understood. Uh, so we have a bit of a learning curve in that respect. Uh, additionally, I would say that some of these experiences that were these experiences that we have uh, had in Sweden are not unique, but rather the modus operandi of the CCP. Um, so in that sense, we shouldn't be surprised that we're experiencing this. Uh, but to the extent that um, influence operations have been identified or made public here in Sweden, uh, political parties have maintained unanimous opposition. Unlike in some other places, this has not become a matter of partisan bickering or uh, conflict. So uh, going forward, I think that's maybe a strength. Uh, and I'll just leave it like that and uh, yeah, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Please, Justina, the floor is yours. great debate and it's again uh, I have opportunity to to meet you all here <laughs> some I met before some I, uh, are new colleagues I met uh, and excited about that well uh, the topic is um, I would like to reflect a bit on uh, uh, PRC versus ROC debate in Lithuania uh, which is going on very hot let's say the hottest debate uh, one of the hottest debates, besides the Belarus debate, of course, uh, it's a China debate, so why not? Well, and as Professor Martin stressed, it's important to draw on some um, concepts. And uh, usually when we discuss China, like PRC or ROC, it's important to draw attention to uh, some concepts. Uh, if we uh, uh, look at how uh, one China policy is understood, uh, like China uh, has uh, a concept or uses uh, the concept uh, as one China principle, Yi Zhong Yuan Zhe. And uh, in the West or Lithuania, we, uh, we apply the concept of one China policy. So it's Yi uh, Zhong Zheng Zhe, it's a bit different. And uh, principle for China is core, core interest. We, we stress on, on, on that, that it's uh, unchangeable. And policy uh, is, uh, it has some flexibility uh, if we uh, debate that. Okay, historical review. Few f I, I'm sorry, the letters are a bit too small. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, what is interesting here um, that uh, at the, uh, um, like historically, uh, uh, Lithuania and Republic of China established relations or, uh, uh, since um, uh, 1923, 
when the Republic of China recognized the Baltic states, in particular Latvia and Lithuania. And uh, since, uh, since then, we were like sort of partners. Uh, and uh, later on, Republic of China did not recognize Soviet occupation of Lithuania. Uh, 1991, after break, uh, uh, break of breakdown of Soviet Union, um, our government uh, established relations with People's Republic of China. And internationally, uh, uh, it, these are two, two different subjects, Republic of China and People's Republic of China. So now we have uh, history, beginning of relations with People's Republic of China. What happened with relations with the Republic of China, we don't know, <laughs> let's say, it's gone. Uh, um, well, and uh, these are um, embassies. Uh, why I show you embassy, uh, I, later you will understand my, my illustration here. Embassy of People's Republic of China was established in Lithuania in 1992, and Lithuania opened embassy in China in Beijing in uh, 1995. Taiwanese office, uh, in Lithuania was established in November 2021, brand new. Uh, first time in world history, <laughs> let's say, <laughs> or in, uh, uh, let's say, uh, in history of opening of such offices, uh, it is Taiwanese office, not Taipei Business Trade Association or anything like that. It's Taiwanese office. In English, it's Taiwanese. And possibly Lithuania will open trade office or some business um, organization in Taipei. Uh, it could be Kaohsiung, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but of course, Taipei. Uh, possibly next year. I didn't see governmental project because it's usually project is online. You can read it. Uh, like when you really establish like embassy or some office, you can, you can find government uh, conclusions and project goes on. Okay. Here are nice illustrations uh, how um, uh, how things look like. So uh, Taiwan is excited about opening office, Ta MOFA of Taiwan, not MOFA of uh, Republic of China. And um, this is the uh, real uh, real picture of from from the office in Vilnius. And if you see Taiwan, uh, it could be adjective or noun. So uh, China's media everywhere says it's office of Taiwan. It's very clear for China. It's office of Taiwan, not Taiwanese office. So that's uh, yeah, like that. Yeah, and one of the first guests who greeted uh, the opening of the office was our uh, freedom leader or in freedom, uh, uh, this in freedom fighting and um, independence movement uh, is Vito Otas Landsbergis. You know, uh, this personality is equal to Václav Havel uh, or uh, Leonard Mary, so uh, this is this shows the importance of this office and relations with with Taiwan. For me, it's not clear when I read media or when I hear public statements of politicians. It's not clear when they say Taiwan, do they mean Republic of China or or uh, it's a bit confusing. But uh, let's say it's Taiwan in in broad context. So that's the greeting and first guest to, to attend, uh, to take part. Yeah, and uh, regarding principles, like one China policy or one China principle, it's very clear that Lithuania for, uh, sticks to one China policy. And to quote our president, uh, Gitanas Noseda, he clearly stated that by supporting Taiwan, Lithuania is not questioning one China policy. So president is very clear about that. Uh, but on the other hand, Lithuania seeks more independent foreign policy. Yeah, this is the uh, quote from, um, I, I took it from China Daily. Uh, we, of course, we take this from MFA of PRC. And uh, uh, first uh, paragraph is amazing because I, I, I read it like, we criticize Lithuania for promoting Ijong Itai policy, like <laughs> they promote or somehow they, they start debate in worldwide debate about one Taiwan, one China, what is Ijong Itai. So I like this concept very much. Let's keep on. <laughs> uh, I hope to, I expect to see it more in, 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 in 
Chinese MFA statements. Uh, it's, it's amazing. And uh, another paragraph is um, an extract from joint communique of Lithuania PRC relations, establishing the relations. And uh, so it's clearly, uh, it's obvious that Lithuania is uh, for uh, relations with PRC and Taiwan is part of PRC. So it says that. Uh, those who don't read characters, uh, we can see Pinyin. Uh, <laughs> just uh, okay, uh, just some fun here. No, uh, and um, uh -huh. why I showed you embassies mm, since um, uh, opening of Taiwanese op office in Taiwan, the relations between Lithuania and China were downgraded. To, to you see this illustration, uh, used to be office uh, uh, embassy of China. People's Republic of China, and now you see clearly in the website that it's the Office of Charged Affairs of PRC in uh, Lithuania. But the embassy um, uh, link is still China embassy, somehow. I don't know, but it's like that. It's not maybe easy to replace it te some technology. Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, debate about China, actually, like the People's Republic of China. Uh, uh, intensified uh, in 2019-2020. Uh, I've never seen such, uh, intense um, be I, I China, uh, such intense debate before. I analyzed China since 2003 in my life, and I waited, let's say, for many, many years to appear to see this debate in my country. And it's really uh, excited in a way. And uh, first things which came into debate that our uh, security uh, intelligence, they uh, stated in national threat assessment, China as um, risk to Lithuania. Uh, it was sort of said that it's a threat, but actually uh, 2019 report was not mentioned as threat, but as risk. Uh, but China understood that as, as threat. And it's for, uh, we, we everywhere said, you, you treat, uh, you consider us as threat, why? And another report, 2020, again, uh, again, China appears as um, risk. Uh, and uh, we'll see the, I'm looking forward to see upcoming report. So what's gonna be <laughs> in, in that one? So that's, um, these are illustrations about debate. Uh, well, uh, this, illustrate, this uh, slide illustrates concrete actions of, um, or activities of, um, of China, let's say, communist government. Uh, you heard about the United Front in uh, the Czech Republic, in Estonia, uh, in Sweden, let's say. And here we have uh, front, United Front uh, appeared in Lithuania. So first time, 2019, May 31st. And um, Yeo Chuan, head of United Front Department, uh, visited Lithuania. Uh, I'm not sure it was understood who, who, who was the guest, but, uh, uh, well, they came. And they met the councillor then of our government, and uh, there were meetings in parliament. And after this visit, what we have, uh, we have um, a very nice event in our cathedral square in Vilnius. This is to illustrate uh, that, um, you know, this was Hong Kong events and uh, our parliament members, in particular, Manta Sadomenas, he's uh, really advocate of Hong Kong, of Taiwan, and uh, uh, reacting to our uh, support to Hong Kong. And it, it coincides actually with the anniversary of the Baltic Way and uh, which um, is a um, symbolic movement in Lithuania's history and it's in blood of every Lithuanian. So uh, activists came to celebrate the uh, anniversary of the Baltic Way, which was uh, starting point was exactly in Cathedral Square in Vilnius. And it was also connected a bit to support Hong Kong. You know, this was e event, anniversary and the with the speaker, you see Manta Sodomianas, parliament member then, now he is uh, vice minister of foreign affairs. And they also included commemorating Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong. 
And here we have the Chinese came and we, we, we participated and uh, <laughs> we, we really uh, uh, behaved aggressively. Even police was called uh, to this event, and uh, China's diplomats were involved into this accident directly. So that's uh, how I, I, I assume that it was uh, planned by United Front, because uh, there is an um, organization of Chinese living in Lithuania as elsewhere. It's not unique, but uh, you can find it in every country. With, uh, even if they ha if they have even one member, it's enough to organize something. Because as it was said, I think, in Alex's presentation, that uh, they all are like uh, security, like we safeguard China's security. And we must do that by law. There is law like um, of national security of, China, of PRC. Yeah, uh, this uh, to illustrate business interests, uh, one of the biggest uh, business companies, Avia Solutions Group, uh, 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 ha had nice contracts with, with Chinese. It's, it is to illustrate that there is economic uh, dimension uh, uh, besides the political dimension, so one, one of the illustrations. It's quite big company. Yeah, uh, this is municipality level uh, cooperation illustration then um, uh, during COVID, beginning of COVID crisis, uh, the Chinese embassy was very active to cooperate with municipalities even, and we donated masks. So this is example from Ukmerge city municipality, and uh, sort of it was propaganda related activities. And actually, uh, we, we really, it's obvious, we found friends easily. We, I think we, we really screen biographies with whom they are co uh, cooperating or get in touch or whom they want to co-opt. And one of the Ukmerge city um, activists, uh, or who, who this guy is with mask, but I, 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 I know his face. Uh, he, he, he used to study in uh, Soviet Union, and um, uh, he has his left-wing uh, person. Let's say he has uh, left uh, political views, so social democrats. So we we clearly pick persons with whom we can get in touch or interested in touch and act. Yeah, uh, um, this is uh, to illustrate Lithuania's, uh, let's say, some sort of um, insurance. Uh, uh, it's very unique law uh, uh, that uh, if, uh, if, let's say, Chinese or third country companies want to invest into Lithuania, uh, uh, we have law, we are screened by, um, uh, we are screened and we, 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 we cannot just invest, uh, we cannot invest just like that. Uh, there, there are procedures. We, it's not easy just to, to, to get. So this law is from 2002. Uh, Lithuania was criticized for, for having this law, for issuing this law. Uh, then in 2002, uh, it was uh, related to Lithuania's Russia policy. But later we were very lucky to, to, to have it. And uh, uh, OECD, let's say this uh, uh, co organization, they, then we uh, gave us good compliment that we have this law. And other countries who didn't have this law, we came to learn uh, how, what it is about and how it works because we wanted to have it against China. Uh -huh. Okay, here is... Uh, um, here we have a group of people who are um, uh, guests in Taiwan. Many parliament members are invited to Taiwan. We, we come, uh, 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 Taiwanese government pay for, for the trips. It's okay, it's practiced uh, by every country. It, Lithuania is not exception here. Uh, then we make friendships and this is formal and non-formal cooperation is uh, going on. And here we, we had a nice campaign uh, of mask diplomacy. Mm, and again, Manta Sodomenas uh, is uh, taking part in mask taking, uh, accepting masks, gift from Taiwan. And as a, uh, as a result, uh, relations between Lithuania and Taiwan were a bit institutionalized, so to say, not political level, but um, some organizational level. 
Lithuania Taiwan Forum was established in October 2020, and this is the uh, picture. Again, Manta Sodomenas, uh, a representative of Taiwan. Actually, he, he is not, he's Taiwanese, original Taiwanese, not uh, Han Chinese. And other parliament members. Uh, another very interesting uh, aspect in Lithuania-China relations debate uh, was uh, participation in 17 plus 1. Originally it was um, 16 plus 1 uh, since 2012. Uh, inter uh, I was really, um, uh, let's say, <laughs> or it's interesting to, 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 to tell that uh, Lithuania became a part of this forum. It's non-formal organization. There is no official par uh, partnership. Uh, like you are not official member. There's no official membership. It's forum. And um, China selectively uh, invited countries. It was obvious that we want to spread influence in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, so uh, it was a right-wing conservative government. 2012. Then, uh, when we left, this forum again was uh, uh, right, uh, right, uh, right government, right wing government, <laughs> doing that. Yeah. And uh, why was it done? Uh, ambassador to China. Now she is back to Vilnius. And Diana Mitskevich, uh, she uh, explained like, it was official position explained. So uh, there were expectations for uh, economic development, and. Um, uh, it was some disappointment, and we left this uh, forum. Okay, and maybe last things I want to draw your attention. Ah, okay, this is a very interesting slide. Uh, I checked, uh, when I was doing research, I checked website of uh, uh, 17 plus 1, now 16 plus 1, uh, and Lithuania is still, it was December 7th. I didn't check today this website, but uh, Lithuania is still a member, uh, or let's say participant of this uh, for forum. Uh, so it's official website of uh, 16 plus 1. Uh -huh. Aha, uh, a couple of slides and I, I'm done here. Uh, uh, we may think Lithuania is crazy, these brave, crazy Lithuanians with uh, Dragon uh, Slayer Minister Gabrielus Landsberg is still a minister um, because there are very hot debates, local debates uh, between President Office and MFA and now another Belarus story is uh, on agenda in media. Uh, the program of 18th government of Lithuania. There is, uh, uh, I, I, I met, I made slash uh, between Lithuanian and uh, English, so it's non-formal, non-formal translation. Uh, so uh, one of success criteria of foreign policy is uh, uh, Lithuania should become important subject in promoting democracy in re in the region and uh, uh, worldwide, internationally. And uh, another uh, one of the main initiatives, uh, Lithuania uh, supports, uh, supports uh, freedom fighters all over the world. Mm, and uh, you see, this is happening. And uh, I don't know, uh, you can be critical about tactics, but uh, they are doing what uh, they are stating in their program. So uh, crazy or not, but it's like that. And uh, uh, another uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, strategic action plan uh, for 2021-2023. Uh, uh, one of strategic goals is to expand Lithuanian's influence and visibility in the world. And with examples, uh, concrete measures, uh, expand diplomatic network in East Asia, Paci Asia Pacific, strengthen partnership with Japan, uh, open embassies uh, in it's already done, Australia, South Korea, and Singapore, and then trade office comes in Taiwan. So these are concrete things to, to, to show that uh, it's really not uh, uh, too crazy, so to say, to, to do that. Yeah, and I made media research. It could be forthcoming discourse analysis. Uh, I, I reviewed uh, 28 articles in Chinese from China Daily and uh, Delphi, Lithuanian, and Estonian also. Uh, 49 articles. Uh, it was very uh, active uh, publishing on the issue, uh, China-Lithuania, uh, Lithuania-Taiwan, and I could continue with research, but uh, uh, now it's uh, time to uh, end up my presentation, and thank you for your attention. 
Thank you, Justina, for an excellent presentation. Uh, I'm happy to have the chance to introduce my forthcoming paper to you on Chinese influence ac activities in Estonia uh, that, I, that is going to be or is produced in cooperation with Synopsis, uh, whose support and uh, feedback I'm very grateful to. Uh, so without much further ado, I will start. Um, People-to-people -people diplomacy uh, activities are meant to influence uh, foreign societies outside of state-to-state uh, -state channels. Uh, two of the most active um, uh, institutions in Chinese foreign affairs systems are, uh, and who practice non-governmental diplomacy are International Liaison Department and uh, Chinese People's Association uh, for Friendship with Foreign Countries. Uh, also active in their interactions with Estonia. Uh, Chinese non-governmental diplomacy uh, comprises or it consists of uh, public diplomacy. Uh, public diplomacy is practiced m by many countries and nothing n too unique about it. But uh, what is unique about Chinese approach is people to people, people to people diplomacy. Uh, which has its history in um, Chinese um, um, past, where China um, used an um, uh, unofficial channel in order to gain international reaction, uh, international <laughs> uh, recognition. Uh, uh, and uh, how uh, the Chinese sources themselves describe people-to-people -people diplomacy uh, they say that by watering down the government's role in foreign exchanges by Chinese citizens and friendship groups, uh, this aims to achieve long-term impact on foreign societies to create positive sentiment that is not dependent of the changing, uh, changing nature of uh, party politics. Uh, and in fact, these relationships or these interactions themselves are actually orchestrated all by uh, party state actors. ILD, the International Liaison Department, in its exchanges has targeted in Estonia upcoming, active, uh, fading politicians from left, right to middle of or center of uh, Estonia's political landscape. Uh, namely, to achieve this long-term uh, impact that is not dependent uh, on the changing nature of uh, democratic politics. Uh, and regardless of who's in power, to have voices supportive of Chinese interest present at all times. According to International Liaison Department's former head, uh, Wang Jia Rui, uh, and this is a quote, the aim of these exchanges is to cultivate people who know China, are friendly to the Chinese, with the aim of finding common language and mutual understanding. This put into a um, practical example is all expenses covered uh, trips to China that are accompanied by uh, pleasantries to members or the elite of uh, small EU member state, often craving just for recognition. With each trip, this is one very good example, with each trip, uh, former Minister of Culture thought that her China expertise is growing, seemingly growing. But in fact, she failed to understand that uh, she was just groomed to advocate for Chinese interest for EU to lose non-market status in regard of China. Uh, this, of course, goes against the best interest of Estonia and also against the best interest of Europe. The multi-mode exchanges that take place between ILD and Estonian uh, politicians enable the CCP also collect information uh, or on the regional domestic level developments, and also EU-wide developments that enable it to make uh, their policy plans, their plan, their activities in regard of member states or in regard of wider European Union. One example of it is uh, 
Estonian Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee's visit to uh, China to meet with the ILD in 2014. And one of the topics that was discussed was the situation in Ukraine. Uh, for, the, uh, for the CCP, this information is important. How, do the, how does EU, how does NATO, how do the member states uh, react to Russia's aggression? As this enables the CCP, or the Communist Party, to plan its activities in regard of South China Sea, Taiwan, Hong Kong. Uh, another active member in Estonian political landscape, uh, and not only uh, political landscape, but also in the business sector, is uh, Chinese People's Association for Friendship with Foreign Countries. Uh, this institution mainly targets local level leaders and business sector. Uh, and it has actively interacted with uh, as association of Estonian cities, and the Estonian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Local level leaders and uh, business community are easy target for Chinese influence activities. First of all, uh, they are not accustomed nor are they obliged to think in national security terms. In addition, they face the pressure from the central government and also uh, from the shareholders to attract Chinese investments and also uh, uh, open or have access to new markets. Quite often, the local level leaders or business community itself is unaware that they are actually dealing with the actors of party state. Uh, because the people-to-people -people diplomacy in itself is meant to water down the relationship with the party state actors and appear as mm, they are dealing with uh, authentic counterparts uh, from the similar field. And, uh, mm, uh, and also, quite often, the local level leaders fail to understand why the opportunity to involve Chine Chinese investments should be disregarded on, for instance, national security terms. With, uh, Tallinn, Tel uh, with Tallinn Helsinki Tunnel, the contradiction uh, between the central and local government was quite obvious. While the central government uh, wished or decided to not to pursue this uh, private sector-led uh, Tallinn uh, Helsinki Tunnel project um, uh, that also involved uh, Chinese state-owned enterprises. Um, they, uh, the central government turned down the project for economical, environmental and security reasons, while the local level, uh, in the form of the Union of Haryu Country Municipalities, wanted the central government nevertheless continue with uh, mm, nevertheless continue with uh, preliminary studies. Uh, CCP values this non-governmental uh, relations as an alternative to the channel, uh, as the alternative channel to f influence foreign uh, audiences. Uh, this is especially useful when uh, international relations or bilateral relations are in a flux or there are some kind of troubles. In, Esto Est in Estonia's case, after the visit of, of Dalai Lama in 2011, the bilateral relations were, or the official channel of communication and exchanges was halted. But at that time, the non-governmental diplomacy took over. CPAFC uh, signed cooperation agreement in 2012 uh, um, with the Estonian, uh, Estonian Association of uh, Cities. And uh, in 2000, uh, at the same year, separately also the local level uh, PA, PAFSC uh, of Xiamen also signed the cooperation agreement. And to be honest, uh, uh, associa Association of Estonian Cities uh, has included or even emphasized their cooperation with uh, 
mm, uh, CPFC in their two consecutive action plans for, uh, that uh, involve the time span between 2014 uh, to 2021. Uh, and there are several cities that have uh, a signed cooperation agreement in the framework, framework of friendship uh, cities. Uh, the, smallest, the smallest of Estonian cities that, ha that has signed uh, friendship cities agreement is a small town near Tallinn, uh, with just a population of a uh, little over 15,000. So nobody's too small uh, for, the <laughs> for the CCP in itself. Both uh, ILD and CPAFC uh, organize conferences and forums that give the CCP opportunity to create positive sentiments towards its interest. So, uh, so when national or subnational level leaders return to their uh, municipalities or to their societies after participating in these forums or, or conferences, Party state actors can hope that uh, China friends will continue to promote Chinese interest by telling a good story of China and, of course, of the multitude of opportunities that uh, good relationship with China behold. But this, of course, should be taken with a grain of salt. For Estonia, the painstaking uh, and, uh, from taxpayers' viewpoint, also costly interaction on multi, uh, multiple levels, on local level, central level, uh, private sector level, has actually pro uh, brought very little actual benefit. Estonia's trade relations with China are still minuscule. Estonia exports just to China out of total exports are just 1.7%. But what we have seen for instance, we've been part of the 16 plus, plus 1 for almost a dec decade. But we, what we have seen is increase in Chinese influence in Estonian society. As Estonian friends uh, who have spent fair share of their professional career in attracting this money train coming from China or, or, or improving trade relations, they are reluctant to accept that their work to large extent over almost a decade has been in vain. The approach of changing China through economic relationship or change to trade, like it's often said, and also facilitated by the personal connections, like I mentioned, established in multitude of forms, has actually proven wrong. wrong. Uh, and China friends still hold on to this false narrative that if Estonia avoids criticizing China, China's human rights record, that one day we might have chance, or one day we might have a breakthrough uh, in relationship with China in the economic front. Actually, there is very little basis for this in reality. Instead of West changing China, I think it's the opposite that is taking pl place. The West, through local interlocutors, has become, has become more like China in itself. As China friends actively silence freedom of speech and criticism uh, in regard of human rights, in order not to irritate the CCP, because they are afraid, then we might lose out of the economic opportunities. All the hard work that we have put in establishing this relationship, this people-to-people -people diplomacy, uh, will not bring us anything. And like I said, in Estonia's case, after almost a decade, nothing has happened. I think it's about time to change our strategy, to look at the cost-benefit ratio. What is in it for us? Or maybe it's this relationship even harmful for us. In itself, the 16 plus for one format is a clever plan to create artificial uh, competition amongst the participant countries. The participant countries, they are fighting with each other for empty promises. They are competitor competitors to each other. And sometimes we also compete in self-censorship. But for what? In most cases, the 16, format, the 16 plus 1 format is just a photo opportunity with the Chinese leaders.
without no actual backing or no actual outcome that benefits our societies. And in itself, by participating in this Photoshop opportunity, we are creating, we're recreating the narrative. If you keep your mouth shut, you might one day profit from China's rise. At the same time, building divisions between participating countries, members of the EU and NATO. And there's a very good example of, of, in a way, how successful this format has been. When in 2000, Estonia, together with five other member states, downgraded their participation in the format, the first question I received from the journalist was that, how will Estonia be punished now? This is, I, I couldn't believe, because this is so out of reality as just believing in fairy tales. <sighs> of course, this is connected with the lingering memories of the Dalai Lama visit and, and the sanctions that uh, were put on Estonian dairy products. But if we look back in the history book, Estonia's dairy products exports to China at the time were just 0.05%. So there wasn't actually anything that took place besides an excellent political warfare campaign that is still ongoing. And to an extent, the narratives both in Estonia or both in China and Estonia have har harmonized because doesn't China say the same thing to its people? If you keep your mouth shut in regard of basic rights, you have chance to take part of China's economic rise. This put into our society or in Estonian society, into Estonian context, this is to promote self-censorship in the name of having one day access to the Chinese market and its investments. It's time to wake up the whip that China tries to lash us, it's imaginary. So also is the carrot. Neither of them exists in reality, only in our imagination, if we don't do our due diligence. Thank you. Are there any questions from the floor? James Sher, please. Oh, yes. Sorry. An old question of mine. Very effective mask. Yes, that's better. How does one combat influence activities in a liberal democracy? There are laws against various forms of corruption. There are laws against espionage. There are laws against theft of property, including intellectual property. Uh, many of these laws, of course, I think you would agree, are outdated, need to be revised, updated. But in a liberal democracy, it's very difficult and arguably not uh, ethically acceptable to have laws against the promotion of influence. And many who are aware of the problem will be very sensitive to taking measures that could lead to people equating our protective measures with Russia's measures of designating various entities and organizations as foreign agents and, uh, and so on. So um, what's the way forward? What do, uh, what do you propose as practical measures to... Um, to reduce the effectiveness of, uh, of the activity, which is the subject of this conference. Is this to all panelists or? Yeah, anyone else who is here who spoke in the earlier panels? I'm Any volunteers? If no, I'm happy to address. Uh, 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 oh. Yes, online as well. Oh, Par, please go ahead. <laughs> Well, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think 
the, the concept of influence is primarily of interest from an analytical perspective. And I think, you know, a lot of things that consti uh, constitute influence work uh, may not need to be uh, made illegal. I think there are a lot of things we can do without making them illegal, uh, partly raising awareness, becoming uh, knowledgeable about narratives uh, can, in many cases, go a long way. Um, when it comes to, you know, harder harder things, you know, things can be made illegal. When it comes to um, money laundering, um, you know, illicit lobbying and, and so forth. But when it just comes to the broader matter of influence as such, I think a lot of things will have to be uh, things that we sort of accept exist, but from a societal perspective that we um, look at very seriously um, and just uh, learn to decipher um, the ways in which, for example, Chinese propaganda work uh, without necessarily making it illegal. Please. I could also add uh, transparency uh, of, uh, of what is uh, like uh, besides to awareness increasing awareness what pair said uh, i would add transparency of governments political parties interest groups as well as another important uh, thing is education uh, what synopsis is doing great work now uh, estonian colleagues and uh, uh, Lithuanian colleagues also, I have academic uh, colleagues who, who do that without advertising, uh, without uh, being public in media. Uh, we talk to students, we talk to colleagues, what, what are the outcomes of all these visits uh, to China like, and, and, and things like that. If it's no lo longer, is Alex? Oh, yeah, I have a microphone on my, on my head. <laughs> please, please join us. <laughs> Martin, please join us. Uh, okay. No, no, no. Anyhow, uh, I just wanted to say I, reg I regret that Alex doesn't seem to be in the room. And, uh, right, okay, because um, he, uh, he probably would be the one, you know, the, the, uh, a relevant voice in this discussion because, as you all know, in Australia, they have actually introduced new legislation that um, has been trying to um, to deal with this challenge. Uh, I mean, they recognize the fact that for some of these activities, there are no existing laws because the you know the, the kind of activities is something so aligned to our understanding of uh, uh, legal and criminal procedures that a new set of uh, legislation had to be created and uh, it would be it would be great if we still had Alex with us to comment on how well or not uh, this legislation has actually worked out in practice I happened to talk to him a little bit about that uh, just before this uh, session in the corridor and uh, basically he told me and I hope I'm not uh, misrepresenting him here <laughs> He told me that uh, the legislation is essentially quite solid, but the implementation uh, leaves <laughs> a lot to be desired. And it's exactly because there doesn't seem to be uh, enough qualified personnel in the law enforcement agencies who would actually understand the, the, the challenge to the level that where they could uh, 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 avail themselves of the of the existing legislation. So I guess it goes as hand in hand, hand in hand. It goes together to have um, transparency, understanding, uh, analysis, uh, and and uh, you know if this is if this per se is not enough, uh, then perhaps new legislation, but a legislation that could be implemented again by knowledgeable uh, law enforcement personnel. If I may add also that uh, mm, China is quite clever in dividing us and uh, targeting different groups, politicians, economics, academics, uh, and they have, seems like a whole societal approach or there's a lot of overlap between different systems that China uses for uh, influence activities, but seems to be lack of cooperation in our field in, in, uh, in regard of um, scientists who are researching this topic, journalists who should you know, 
interview or or question these uh, approaches, uh, take politicians into account or ac for accountability. So uh, I think there also should be more cooperation in uh, in uh, in our societies in in um, how to say reacting to the Chinese melon uh, activities or influence activities. There was a question from Thomas. Yes, uh, thank you. It's rather more a comment and mostly to you, Frank, a collegial sort of a note of, of, of caution um, regarding China's punishment capacity. Mm. Uh, I think the statistic, uh, looking just at the foreign trade statistic of Estonia or Lithuania for that matter, is just a tip of an, of an iceberg. Mm. Uh, chiefly because, for instance, in Lithuania, uh, manufacturing is a very important economic sector and it's very export-oriented. What's actually happening is that China is now trying to purge Lithuania from its supply chains. Mm. So they're basically leaning on the multinationals, which have among their suppliers, first, second, third tier suppliers, Lithuanian companies, mm. to deny or the, to sever the contracts with those companies. And that is at least one multinational from the EU has already done that. Mm. Now, knowing that for Lithuania, uh, other manufacturing giants like Poland and, and Germany are very important export markets, mm. that will be painful. I have full confidence in Lithuanian business capacity to adapt and adjust. With, uh, you know, they've done that after you know, Russian sanctions, mm -hmm. counter sanctions and whatnot. Mm. But the, it's just to underline that economic pain of China's retaliation will, will go deeper and will be more widespread than just looking at the statistical numbers of our foreign, of foreign trade mm. balance. Thank you. Uh, just a quick comment or uh, response to this one is also that, uh, in a way, we shouldn't sell ourselves short also. We maybe overemphasize the importance of Chinese market, but uh, in return, European market is also almost as important for China. No, not maybe that important as their population is much bigger, but still uh, they need technology, they need uh, cooperation, they need uh, to sell their products here. So, uh, but again, if we allow China to pick the fights one by one with each other and pull us, circle us and corner us, then of course there's, uh, we are not even in the race in that case. Thank you. On, on top of that, there are multilateral organizations that are designed to prevent exactly this kind of coercive uh, behavior, right? This seems to be go directly against the WTO uh, regulations. <laughs> Um, well, then, then we should probably try to make them care. And, um, you know, there's all this talk about this new coercive um, mechanism introduced by the EU. So let's see how well or not again it works. But there must be proper responses to that. You know, usually uh, most of these activities cuts, cut both ways, right? It's a bilateral economic relationship again. So there are two parties to, to this relationship. Are there any further questions? If no, any questions, I would like to ask Par. Uh, oh, sorry, there was? Yes, Ralph, uh, wait for the micro microphone. Yeah, thank you so much. I have a question for Per, actually, um, about the Swedish case, because you were mentioning the Nordic Chugung Party, right? Um, which I think is headquartered in, in Stockholm, right? Now, when, when you looked at that, um, to what extent is that um, a, 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 a place that is just um, working on Sweden, and to what extent is it one that is in, indeed working on the entire Nordic region? Does it make a difference that it's located in Sweden? Do you see more activity in Sweden than in other places, or is it, in your assessment, working on the Nordic realm equally? Yeah, so uh, it hasn't been... Um it was formally active for a couple of years, and now uh, they don't publish anything online uh, anymore. Now and then, uh, you can see the names of individuals involved appearing uh, every now and then, but it's a bit uncertain to what extent uh, they are still active. Uh, when they did publish uh, on their own website and on social media, uh, it emerged that they had some sort of local affiliates in the other Nordic countries, or at least individuals who nominally uh, had responsibility of the other Nordic countries. So it was at least designed to be a fully Nordic organization rather than just a Swedish organization um, nominally Nordic. 
Actually, I have, a, I have a question for Per as well. It's just out of sheer curiosity. Whatever happened to, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the previous uh, Chinese ambassador in Stockholm after he was... Was that a promotion or was it a, was it a punishment <laughs> when he was recalled? That is exactly the question a lot of people in Stockholm are asking right now. Uh, as far as I know, we don't uh, know that he has received a new position. Uh, I would also add that uh, there's been no formal decision of appointing a new ambassador so far. Uh, so while there's been media reports about who uh, about a person that might uh, replace him, uh, it has not so far been formally decided uh, who will be the ambassador, uh, next Chinese ambassador in Stockholm. And do you think there's a there's a feeling of uh, failure in Beijing with obviously their policies towards Sweden, or do you think they don't care at all? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, well, I think it sort of echoes the larger debate about uh, to what extent the wolf warrior style of diplomacy actually works. I think there's the case to be made that some people in Beijing would uh, appreciate that in uh, Guizhongyou. Uh, stood up for PRC interests and very forcefully so, uh, regardless of the fact that it only had a negative uh, impact in Sweden and received no support uh, whatsoever. Uh, I think, if anything, uh, Wei Tsung-yo heightened the, the sense that Sweden is threatened by China. So, of course, that can also have positive effects for the PRC if, if the effect is that Sweden becomes even more hesitant to take um, controversial um, you know, to do controversial things in uh, regards to the Sweden-China relationship. Thank uh, you. Sorry, sorry to push this, but has that been the case? Like, is Sweden now more reluctant to uh, stand up to certain elements of Chinese policies, or or is it the other way around that uh, Sweden has been sensitized to some, you know, darker aspects of um, China's foreign policy? I think it's difficult to compare over time. And the Sweden, you know, is caught up in the same zeitgeist as the rest of Europe and the rest of a lot of uh, other liberal democracies in that we're becoming more critical of the Chinese party states. Uh, so I think the question is, how would, you know, this new zeitgeist be manifested in new policy had it not been for these threats? Um, so I think it's a bit, bit, a bit difficult to compare with um, previous policy, because generally, uh, switch foreign policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis China has been very hesitant, uh, very careful. Um, but when it comes to things, you know, what like the situation that Lithuania is in at the moment, you know, one of the first reactions by Swedish media was to ask the question, you know, what consequences would we suffer if we did something similar, uh, which sort of is, I think, an unfortunate mindset to sort of start by asking yourself what are all the horrible things that could happen to us rather than starting with the question of what are all the interests at stake and what are the possible including possible benefits of uh, changing the name of the representation here in stockholm i have a question for justina i i i, I wondered uh, there's in Estonia a lot of um, talk about um, how Lithuania is actually facing two crises at the same time. Uh, and in regard of uh, at least one, uh, the crisis coming from the Russian, <laughs> Russian uh, border activities, <laughs> gray zone activities. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's been a lot of support, I understand, from Baltic states and from the wider region. Yeah. But in regard of China, how has the support been? Uh, is there similar, comparable support? Uh, yeah, thank you for for question. Well, uh, I should check if government still didn't resign. <laughs> 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 it's uh, yeah. Uh, well, um, it's it's good question. Uh, if we look at the case of customs uh, bar, like uh, ban for Lithuanian uh, companies or for Lithuania in general. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the country was banned from uh, importing things, uh, goods to China for quite a few days, but after pressure of European Commission, or I, I assume it was some sort of pressure, mm -hmm. I, 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 don't I don't have insights from, from the process, 
uh, because otherwise it wouldn't happen that Lithuania was back to customs registers and uh, we, our goods could be imported again, uh, like um, in a way. Uh, and uh, I, I, I sense that there is support for that. Uh, maybe it's uh, still unusual situation for the, the European Union, let's say, one of the main uh, uh, partners who could uh, back up us and, and help or unite other countries to push, uh, to push, for, for, to push China uh, because it has leverage. I'm sure EU has leverage um, to, to, to work or help us more. Um, on political front, uh, like when we uh, cancelled uh, uh, participation in 17 plus 1, uh, Gabrielus Landsberg is, um, uh, like tried to promote uh, 27 plus 1 format. Uh, it means U European Union countries and China. Uh, it is, uh, this question is raised. I don't, I, I, again, I don't have insights how, how effective is this uh, initiative. Uh, it, does it get support uh, from uh, EU member states? Uh, and uh, ob obviously there is a support from the United States, uh, our main strategic partner in foreign policy, security policy. Uh, uh, this, this gives uh, really, um, uh, really, uh, let's say, moral uh, feeling that you are not alone, you are not left alone. And I, I, I think it's very positive that uh, uh, this situ these situations demonstrate that uh, you are not alone. Uh, whatever happens, uh, you can share happiness or, or tragedy with someone uh, and look for, uh, uh, get uh, help and uh, uh, reach some results. So some sort of re reflection what mm. comes to my mind mm. at the moment. Mm. I have a question for Frank. Mm. Um, mm. Well, the Lithuanian case, like seeing how Lithuania has suffered so far uh, from building relationship with Taiwan, uh, will this uh, situation make uh, the Estonian government more careful in its approach to Taiwan? Mm -hmm. And has the, uh, the idea of Indo-Pacific strategy ever been brought up in uh, Estonia? Thank you, that's a very good question. And I think this is, uh, this is a general trend that uh, many European member states are uh, not only focusing as they previously have done single-handedly on China, but they are looking more towards single or <laughs> towards sim similarly minded or like-minded countries in the Asia-Pacific region in general. And uh, similarly to Lithuania, Estonia also has opened embassies recently in uh, Singapore, in South Korea, mm -hmm. and uh, we have had long time good cooperation with Japan. So uh, I think there's, there's definitely something to win for both sides as uh, the Asia-Pacific countries, they are much more dependent on China, on Chinese market, than we are. And uh, we are interested in exploring also and expanding our trade partners, investment partners. So, in a way, this would make both our neighbors, neighbors you know, distant neighbors uh, in Asia-Pacific, their systems, their economic system more resilient to Chinese coercion, and likewise also our own system. So I think this is something, um, uh, something what we can see also from the strategy pa papers. Uh, EU just recently published Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, UK has done, uh, Holland, Germany, Estonia is making one. So uh, this is a general trend. And, uh, and I really liked how Lithuanian uh, foreign committees, um, uh, foreign committees uh, chairman uh, explained this one that uh, uh, the threat, or, or how to say, the risk with China is quite big. So it would be wise to diversify and also look towards similar or like-minded countries. And also this uh, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, they are uh, societies with very ad advanced economies. So there is um, uh, a lot of oppor opportunities for cooper cooperation. Thank you. If there are no more questions, then let's please give the
applause to the speakers. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bear. And, uh, okay. and now it's time for the concluding remarks. Martin, please, can you share your... Well, uh, thanks everybody for staying with us so long until six o'clock in the evening. I think it's brave of you to be still with us. I really appreciate that. It was a very long day. It has been a very long day. Uh, but of course, despite this being such a long day, we only touched upon so many things, right? So I think this will be an ongoing discussion. I would encourage those who um, um, got interested in to some of the topics that we have discussed, um, both here and uh, those who might be watching us online, to occasionally check our website, uh, synopsis.cz, and uh, especially synopsis.cz slash EN, which is the English website, where we publish our, our new research. And uh, I will be looking forward to seeing everybody in the next year's event that we're already thinking about. Thank you. <laughs> On Estonian Foreign Policy Institute's behalf, I would like to thank Martin. Uh, I thank forgot to th thank, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Now I feel a little embarrassed because I, I of course, forgot to <laughs> thank those who are who deserve the most uh, um, gratitude from our side, and that's uh, our co-hosts, our co-organizers, the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute and uh, ICDS, International Center for Defense and Security. And first of all, of course, Frank, who did enormous amount of work to make this uh, event happen. And also to all our participa participants, including those who came from very, very far. And then those whom I already thanked before, that is those of you who were so generous with your time that you stayed with us to this very late hour. Thank you. <laughs> On Estonian Foreign Policy Institute's behalf, I would like to thank Martin. <laughs> The colleagues at Synopsis, uh, the colleagues who are working on these uh, interesting and challenging topics. Um, I also would like to thank Martin and the Synopsis um, uh, colleagues for the trust to bringing the, the annual workshop to Estonia, to the Nordic Baltic region, to also help increase awareness, not only in the heartland of Europe, but also <laughs> on the periphery. So thank you for that, and uh, hopefully we have many more opportunities to cooperate in the future. Looking forward to it. <laughs>